first of all, a massive welcome to everybody who's joined the call today. And I'd like to virtually welcome you to Leeds. Um, so this is the Instruct Best Practices in Crowian meeting, um, which was due to be held in person um, at the University of Leeds this year. But for obvious reasons, we've moved, uh, we've had to move online. And while that's a bit disappointed because I don't get to see all of your lovely faces and it means that I'm sat in my living room um, speaking to you today. Um, the really, really nice thing about going online is that it, it's meant that so many more of you can join us uh, and not just from across Europe, but also all across the world. And I'm really excited about the program um, uh, uh, that we've got lined up for you. So since you can't be with us um, in here uh, in Leeds today, I um, thought I'd just give you a bit of an introduction to the city. Um, so. Leeds is a beautiful city, um, lots of a uh, mix of modern and old architecture um, and has a bit of a reputation for it raining all of the time. But I'd like to use this opportunity in this audience to put that to rest because Leeds actually has less um, annual rainfall than Rome. So um, yeah, so it's, it's really a, a very sunny as well as a very beautiful city. And one of the things I'm most disappointed about in terms of not being able to host you all physically in Leeds um, is the food scene. And one of the things Leeds is most famous for is a good curry. And um, one of the things I can't share with you virtually is the joy of the Akbar's family naan bread, um, like uh, this one here, which is where we were going to hold the conference dinner. So um, if any of you are ever in Leeds, um, uh, do definitely go and check out Akbar's curry house. Um, but anyway. Um, so in terms of our electron microscopy facility, um, we're based um, on the University of Leeds campus, which is just north of the city centre um, in the building um, with the big black arrow. And the, uh, my electron microscopy um, facility sits within a network um, of research facilities more broadly within the Faculty of Biological Sciences, although we serve a research community that spreads um, uh, right across um, the university um, and um, to our external users. In the basement of this um, rather lovely brutalist architecture building, um, we, we house our EM facility. Um, so we have our two Titan cryoses um, and three other transmission electron microscopes, um, which we use for various things. And just in, as importantly as the kit, um, the people that live in the basement with the kit um, are our um, director, um, Neil Ranson, who's our academic director of the facility. And then there's myself, Dan, Emma, and Martin on the EM facility team. Um, and you'll be meeting Dan and Emma over the course of the meeting. So that's a bit of a very brief introduction into our facility. But in terms of um, access routes, um, if anybody on the call is interested um, in, in accessing the technology that we have to offer, then I just wanted to very quickly highlight that we do um, facilitate um, access both directly, so please get in touch, um, and as well as um, funded um, access opportunities through INEX Discovery and of course Instructs. And you can always email us, you can always tweet us. Um, so yeah, please do drop us a line. So having equipment within the facility um, is all very well, but actually the most, the thing that we're most proud of is the research, which um, our lovely user base, um, based both internally and externally is able to do. And here's just a few of the recent structures um, which um, our user community have, have produced. But really the focus of this meeting, um, and although these structures are all independently beautiful, the focus of this meeting is really around how can we facilitate world-class research through the management of our research infrastructure? One of the things I really love about this meeting is that every single facility is unique. We're all unique in terms of the equipment, the, um, the team that operates them, our financial models, um, our community that we serve. And I think that we can learn an aw awful amount from each other in terms of um, uh, and, and get really, really good ideas and uh, to help us be able to help our users to do the very best science. So really excited um, to welcome everybody here today. I know um, this meeting, as I said, is predominantly aimed at those who are involved in the management of research infrastructure, but it's really fantastic to see so many PhD students and postdocs also taking an interest in, um, in, this, in this meeting here today. Next, I'd like to say a massive thank you to Thermo Fisher, um, who have sponsored um, the meeting in its virtual format. Really, really appreciative of the support, and you'll get the opportunity to hear from Thermo Fisher um, in tomorrow's sessions. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say a, a massive thank you to Instruct Eric, um, and particularly um, um, Steph, who has been doing an enormous amount of the organisation behind the teams and has done a brilliant job. So um, thank you to them for making it happen today. Um, and finally, I just want to say a massive thank you to every one of you for joining. 
And thank you to everybody who's but attending, agreed to speak, a chairing a session, coming to a breakout session. I think especially at the moment, being able to bring people together um, is something which I think is, well, I don't know, I can't speak for anybody else, but it's certainly good for me. And it makes it, I really, really benefit from being able to talk to people about the same, who are experiencing the same kinds of challenges that I'm experiencing every day in managing my facility. So it's great to see you all and uh, I'm really excited for the, about the programme of talks we've got to offer. So on that note, um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. So Ludo um, heads up the NESA, I'm sure needs no introduction um, to, to this audience um, here, but heads up um, the NESAN facility um, and is going to be giving us a, an update on the exciting activities that they have going on. So the floor is yours, Ludo. All right, so thanks for the introduction, Becky. I uh, really liked uh, to go to Leeds now because, uh, you know, if it's not training that much, uh, that's quite uh, amazing. I'm actually surprised by that fact. So I thought uh, I only have 15 minutes, so I'll uh, briefly introduce you to Nathan and uh, what's been uh, happening the last uh, couple of years, basically. Um, so I just list here some talking points I wanted to uh, to discuss uh, today. It's not really a plan of the talk, but all these points will be addressed at some point or another during the talk. Um, First, uh, let's start by uh, who, what is Nissan and some facts you might not know. So actually, when I discuss with scientists uh, all over the world, sometimes they have misconceptions about Nissan. Uh, are we part of the Mosher? Are we our own entity? And so on. So I thought I should start with clarifying this. So Nissan is actually owned and is part of uh, Leiden University in the Netherlands. We are part of the science faculty and uh, together with the medical center at Leiden, uh, they are both the main stakeholders of uh, Nissan. Uh, NASEM was actually started in uh, 2011 as one of the first uh, Crow EM Center open access, uh, having an open access policy so anyone could apply uh, to access uh, NASEM services. Um, since then, a few synchrotrons have uh, adapted the same model. So in the Netherlands, NASEM is part of a national EM consortium. So we are located in Leiden. Uh, you see here the big circle. It's 20, 30 kilometers from Amsterdam. It's a short 15 minutes uh, train ride from uh, the airport. Uh, so together with all these universities, uh, we form a network of electron microscopy uh, facilities uh, called NAMI. Um, here I've tried to list groups doing uh, EM and making use of NASEN in the Netherlands. I'm sure I missed a few. So if you're listening, sorry, and just send me an email if I missed you. Um, so this NEMI, this Dutch consortium, is organizing uh, technical uh, expertise nodes. So NASEN is the high resolution EM for life sciences, but there's all sort of EM going on in the Netherlands, uh, from single particle crow EM of membrane proteins in Groningen to material science in Eindhoven, uh, even uh, some mass spectrometry going on in uh, Maastricht. So there's a lot going on in um, the Netherlands. So I invite you to have a look at the NAMI website uh, for further uh, reading. So NASEN is part of the Faculty of Science, which has been uh, redesigned in the last few years. So there's a new building coming up. Um, it's a bit slow, but uh, these three wings here, plus fourth here where NASEN is located is a new building. Hopefully this will be finished quite soon, but with Corona, everything has been slow uh, at the moment but uh, we are located in a brand new building. We are embedded in a bioscience park surrounded by uh, pharma companies and uh, other uh, biotech companies. So that's quite a uh, uh, exciting place to be. The team, so since uh, middle of 2019, there's now an executive board uh, overseeing a Nissan's uh, running. Uh, so Jo Sangelen, Ariana Brigger and Michael Lammers form uh, this executive board. Um, and then we are a team of uh, five people at the moment looking for a six person to be uh, to join us and, as an EM scientist. We are final, finalizing interviews and making starting to make offers uh, soon for this uh, last position. Uh, William Notborn is the latest addition to the team. He just uh, accepted an offer, so he's joining in January uh, of uh, next year. He's going to start. Uh, mostly Wen Young uh, is doing all the microscopy. Frederick is uh, managing all the IT part and Annika is doing uh, all the business coordination. And I'm just running around. Uh, at Nason, we have a BSL2 uh, containment uh, for one of the lab, uh, so that allows us uh, to accept 
all sorts of projects. Um, in terms of uh, lab equipment, it's very standard. We only have the VitroBot at the moment for preparing samples, but uh, we are looking at uh, other options, obviously. Uh, we can store uh, your grids. We have our own system, our own box system that we designed a couple of years ago. Um, drawings are online. Anyone can download them and have a similar box made by their own shop. And then the rest is quite standard. In terms of machines, so we have two Titan Krauses. Um, one of them has been upgraded with a K3 BioQuantum uh, this year. Uh, now is a fish can up, we can get up to 400 images an hour, so that's quite uh, impressive. And the other one is CS corrected as a K2 BioQuantum and also Falcon 3. Uh, so both can do um, tomography, both have Sariolian calibrated, both can do single particle, mostly with EPU. Uh, we also use it for uh, we use them for training operators. A bit more recently, the last uh, two three years, we uh, acquired the Sidentry uh, Cryo TEM uh, Talos from Tomosher as well. So that's mostly for screening early on projects for local groups for training new users to Cryo EM. And we also acquired an Akelos uh, Cryo FIPSEM uh, to prepare lamellas for tomography. And it's not yet open as a service this Akelos, but uh, now that the team is growing, and that's uh, something we are really uh, planning on doing. And very, very recently, the last two weeks, last week of September, we received some uh, cryoclaim equipment, so high pressure freezing, ultramarcotome, cryoclaim, and it's also in the BSL2 containment. Uh, so this belongs to Iona Briggers group, but it is placed at Nascent, so Nascent will at some point hopefully um, uh, offer this uh, as a service. And it's quite complementary to uh, the other tools we have, such as the Akelos. <clears throat> so as I said, uh, Nissan is open for uh, anyone, companies or academic uh, in the world. We do some pre preparation, quality assessment, but that's mostly uh, for companies, I have to say, or for training purposes. Uh, the main thing we do is data collection on the Titan crosses. We do some data processing also for companies or collaboration, lots of training and education, and a bit of research and development, mostly as a collaboration. So the training, uh, we do either one-on-one -on -one or we organize courses. Uh, you've heard about the Crow EM schools uh, from the uh, emlearning.com website from Tomosher. That's So we run a couple of schools uh, with Tomosher. Uh, we've run some one-on-one uh, -on -one training. So just uh, get in touch uh, with us. Uh, and then uh, I can inform you a bit uh, in more details what's uh, available. In terms of accessing uh, nascent data collection services, for example, you can just go on our website. There's a form to fill, and then we evaluate it uh, before we accept it. It's mostly technical feasibility. And what's, uh, what's quite uh, unique is that the reviewing is private and it's internal to nascent. So no one else will see your application. And it's a paper use, so you pay per day and prices are available on our website. And then the second uh, mode of access, a bit like Becky described for leads, it's the reviewed access mode. So we are part of uh, Instruct and INEX discovery as well. So very similar to leads, you can go online and uh, submit an application that will be externally reviewed. Uh, and then access is either highly subsidized or free. And this is available for pretty much every international uh, groups. And then uh, we are part of the NEMI, this Dutch uh, electron microscopy consortium. And this is open for Dutch groups. And access is based on uh, scientific, uh, scientific excellence and um, price is highly subsidized. Yeah. And, but we have a limited number of NEMI days that we can provide per day, per year, obviously. So let's talk a bit about the data. So that's just an old diagram. So in terms of um, access to NISEN, this NEMI consortium forms around 65% of our access. So that is the main bulk of what we do. And then the European projects or international access is a quarter of our access. And then the last approximately 10% is industry access. Uh, I think one particularity about Nissan is that in the, since 2019, the tomography uh, data collection has uh, increased quite a lot. So now we are mostly doing 50-50, 50% single particle, 50% tomography. I think the main reason for that is that the naming groups, the Dutch groups uh, are doing a lot of tomography. There's quite a few nodes doing tomography 
and that has increased while they came more often that has increased the tomography uh, at Mason. And uh, we produce approximately 600 terabytes of data a year, but we don't keep it. So for us, it's not a big deal to manage. We have some local buffer storage. We have some uh, online storage uh, for uh, data delivery. And most of the data we collect is from uh, the Catan cameras. The Falcon we mostly use for screening or collecting small data sets quickly. So of course, uh, as most of the other facilities, we have a live processing during data collection. So we have a couple of options. Option one is warp, like uh, anyone can install. Uh, it's quite uh, nicely designed and you can do tomography processing with it. So uh, all the users requested warp. So we installed it, we have it running now on the machines and available. And we have of course our own setup that uh, we can just uh, use um, published uh, software like motion core CTA fine and we get the output from those software and plot values over time. And the good thing is uh, about our homemade system is we can deliver reports to the users and we can keep track of uh, what's happening over time for each project. All right, so now we have to deliver the data to the user. That's not so uh, straightforward sometimes. It sounds easy, but sometimes it's not. Uh, so the easiest for us is to use an external company. It's called Surfsara, it's based in Amsterdam. And they store data online for us and make it available to the users. So the good thing is we don't need to manage the security, the user accounts. Uh, once the data is there, it's safe, it's archived offline as well. And um, it's very flexible. We can use uh, as much storage as we need and we only pay for what we use. So that's quite uh, flexible. And of course, uh, most people, they go through this pre-processing during data collection and they try to get to the classes sometimes. Uh, so you can do this with uh, already available software. So we decided to go another route and try to do uh, something a bit different. So we uh, have all this metadata from the uh, cryoses and from the pre-processing reports we, we deliver. So we organize this metadata into projects. So at the moment, our projects are listed on the website. And uh, so that's project name. And then we grab from which cryos is coming, which software was used and so on. And we list uh, different links here where we can generate the report, look at some images, we can plot uh, the different values and so on. So that's that's nice. And we can do this over time and go back a year before, for example, and have a look at this. Um, but it's, it's still a bit manual. So what we are doing now is uh, implementing a database where it will be uh, all these parameters, all this metadata will be uh, grabbed and uh, arranged into this database that will be then searchable. And you can plot graphs and really have a look at how, what's the speed of your data, what grid type was used and, and so on. So it's, it's just uh, to organize this, all this available information that we're not really using, organize it a bit better and make it uh, useful in the end. So uh, it's, it's still not implemented. So we are finalizing the design and starting implementation, but hopefully uh, this database will be placed in our wiki because we have a wiki with best practices, protocols, or in our management system. So we have a management system that uh, we use as well. So I thought also I'll spend a few minutes uh, discussing the uh, corona crisis because uh, for us in the Netherlands and at uh, Leiden, it's, uh, it's a bit of a mess. It keeps on changing the rules and the protocols you have to, to use and uh, you know, uh, Leiden University, they set up a page about updates and sometimes you have to check twice a, twice a day to see if there's any new update. And uh, I tried to make a list of a few days of new updates and this and that. So it's, it's quite uh, stressful. I think all the facilities, uh, they had the same issue this year that how to adapt and how to make sure you can stay open and keep on running basically for your users. So uh, for example, in, this is uh, the control room uh, for cars too. Now it's it's huge. We used to be four or five sometimes, and now it's only two people in the room. So that's got uh, uh, restrictive now. Uh, so what we had to do is uh, adapt a little bit. So we moved some of the controls to different places. So now one control per room, basically one, two users, and that's it. So we've set up a remote data collection and uh, monitoring, which you know was already available, but we were naturally using it because people would just come to the facility. But uh, since this year, well, we had to adapt and all the users had to adapt. So we have set up a 
couple of options for remote data collection. So option one is a simple team viewer on the GitHub PC, for example, or on the support chair PC. Uh, you can uh, you can view the warp running. You can have the EPU window with the Cryos PC, and in the background is the K3, so you could run Seriolium also on there. Uh, that's quite uh, easy to set up. Works well. Most users are quite happy with that. And uh, if you are operating the Cryos yourself in the facility, then you can also share the screen with Team Viewer um, and lock the screen so the the uh, remote user will not click on any uh, button if you don't want to. And option two is a remote con remote pads. Uh, so we have a few uh, remote pads uh, that we shipped around the Netherlands, and uh, we are setting it up. It's not working properly yet because our VPN is too slow. So we are discussing with uh, IT of uh, the university, uh, but in principle, it's working with Maastricht University already, which is a three and a half hour train ride from us. So you know, in terms of uh, in times of Corona, it's uh, it's not ideal for them to travel all the time. So that's uh, very important to, to set up. And then they will have, uh, or they, they have full control uh, of the cryos, basically. So uh, just a couple of minutes to mention a couple of uh, papers that were uh, done this year on coronaviruses. So uh, there's a group in the, the medical center uh, that is working on the RNA plus viruses uh, for a few years now. And when Corona hit, they, they, they added the uh, Corona to the list and they managed paper lamellas on our kilos and collect some uh, crowd tomography, uh, some at nascent, some in, the, in Germany, and uh, they published in Science uh, this nice paper that uh, hopefully uh, explains how the uh, Corona is uh, able to replicate uh, and uh, maybe, uh, you know, will help uh, develop new drugs uh, to prevent that. And then, uh, more recently, so it's under uh, review still, but there's a paper with uh, Janssen Vaccines, which is a company in the bioscience park uh, next to Nason. So it's a collaboration between us and them. Um, so they are developing a vaccine against uh, Corona, obviously, and they design a construct uh, on the uh, ACE uh, trimer of, the, uh, of this uh, COVID uh, to develop a vaccine uh, towards it. And they wanted to show that the trimer is very stable and that's uh, a good model to develop their vaccine. Uh, obviously, uh, there is uh, still a third of the particles that show this uh, open spike uh, compared to the closed uh, S-trimer, uh, but it's much less than in the uh, non-mutated uh, sample. And we reached quite some decent resolution, so this should be published soon. <clears throat> All right, and just some other examples of uh, publication at Mason. Um, some uh, Face plate uh, tomography, single particle, uh, some work on different viruses. Uh, so this one was a BSL2 virus as well, I believe, uh, and some uh, other work. All right, and I think that's it. Those are the funders. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Instruct Eric, INEX Discovery, and Instruct Ultra. So Instruct Ultra is funding this aspect of uh, remote control and data management. And the NAMI, of course, which is uh, uh, funding 50% of our access time, basically, and the uh, University of Leiden and, and VO as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ludo. It was a really interesting talk. And um, we've already had a few questions in the Q&A, but please um, do people keep them firing in. Um, so first couple of questions that came in um, were on uh, the FIBSEM. So somebody's asked specifically, is it the Equilus 2 or the first version? So it's the first version of the Aquilos. We don't have the upgrade yet, but we have been discussing with the Mofshore about getting the uh, upgrade uh, to Aquilos 2, yes. And how are you finding um, trying to um, manage access to FIBSEM? Because obviously it's a, it's a very different beast from trying to offer single particle collection on a cryos, for example. Yeah, so, uh, you know, at the moment, it's really a re research machine. So the users are trained, uh, they are independent, um, so that's mostly how we have been using it. And also the team is quite small, or it's been small for a year now, so we have not really had the opportunity to develop this as a service. But now we have two new people joining as, a EM, as EM staff, sorry. So that's something we are going to develop, yeah. But I think the main part is that we really have to restrict the projects and be very specific of what we want to accept and what is not acceptable, basically. Yeah. Um, so the next questions are around um, how you operate a biosafety level two. So um, someone has asked, um, 
how is uh, is the room where the microscope is at also BSL2? Yes, so they are BSL2, but uh, because we don't do any sample preparation in there, it's quite uh, easy going with the health and safety people. You know, it's a tiny amount of sample, it stays in liquid nitrogen, it's, so they have been quite uh, accommodating. But so yes, they are, we can do BSL2 data collection. Yeah, everything is BSL2. Nice, and in terms of um, biosafety work, in one of the breakout sessions tomorrow, um, how to operate microscopes at BSL 2 and 3 is going to be included in that breakout. So if anyone is interested in that, then you can check out that breakout. Um, so um, we've now got a couple of questions on um, on remote access and, and training. So these are all kind of related, but um, when you, you're, so you're looking to offer remote access through the hand panels, do you have I guess the first question is how do you train users before you let them loose rem remotely? Um, do you have kind of a set way of doing that? And do you need those users to achieve a particular level of training before you'll let them loose on the hand panels? Yeah, so these hand panels, this is restricted to Dutch groups, part of this NEMI consortium. So those groups, they come re very regularly to nascent. So they are the main bulk of our users. So that's, you know, um, so that's the only groups we will allow to do remote panel controls. Also, each uh, node with this remote panel has a facility manager that is responsible for its users. So we trust them that they will only allow uh, accepted users, basically. So we don't have a formal form to sign, but there's informal agreement, basically. The next question that came in was, was around um, that really interesting data or, or project management pipeline that you showed, which I'm, I'm sure will be of great interest to a few people, quite a lot of people on the call. How did you go about um, putting that together? How long did it take? Did you need dedicated expertise? Yes, yeah, so we have an IT expert uh, in the lab and uh, that's his, uh, one of his projects to design this database and uh, design the, the wiki, implement the database, and so on. So that's his job, yeah. I mean, we have a dedicated person for that, yeah. Otherwise, there's no time to do it, definitely. Yeah, yeah. But he does this on the side. Huh? His main job is still uh, data handling, making sure the hardware runs and all of this. So we all have 20 30% time to do research or what we like to do. So that's his 20%, 30% uh, research time, basically. Yeah. That sounds like a very productive use of somebody's 20 to 30% of yeah. their time. Yeah, definitely. That's useful for us, yes. Absolutely. It looks like a great system. Um, uh, I guess a more practical operational question now. So how long do your sessions normally? And I guess a follow up to that is, um, do you have you seen your average session length changing with new technologies coming online like APHIS or new detectors? Yeah, great question. So that's definitely once we got the K3, we were not sure what's going to happen, really, because the speed of the detector is so much quicker than the K2 or Falcon. Uh, so this has changed, or oh, let's say the sessions themselves are the same. So it can be one to three days, but the way it's happening is different now. I mean, users, they will come with 12 grids for two days and they want to collect data for each grid almost. So, you know, before we would do one sample, one day, two day. Now we, we will do maybe, or we expected to do four samples in two days, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. And do you think that's going to have an implication in terms of the support resource as well? So, um, so not just having those shorter sessions, but do you see you needing to switch the focus of your team in order to be able to deliver on those sessions? Yeah, and that's also the main reason now we are starting to train more users to be independent. So more and more with these NEMI groups, especially now we, we load the samples, we check the machines, and we start the session with them, and that's it, then they're on their own. So that's because otherwise you can't really ask your staff to stay until midnight every day or come on the weekend and so on. So that's that's the only way to do it really now. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. And um, there there are still some un there will be some unanswered questions in the chat. So apologies to anybody we're not going to get round to. But in the interest of time, this will be the the last question. But um, somebody's asked, um, do you use the um, phase plate for tomography? And if so, how do you manage um, that over time, so for example, over the course of a tomography collection? Yeah, so yes, some users want to use faceplate, especially for tomography. Uh, in that case, uh, most projects we will do is tomography with faceplate during the day, but overnight we take it out and we do a normal uh, tomography session uh, because we don't find it stable enough to, to be confident that it will be okay overnight. So that's how we run it, basically. Yeah. 
it's yeah. um it's a really interesting um technical question i know we've had three different phase no four different face plates now and their behavior has been really really different face plate to face plate the one we're on at the moment is actually it takes forever to charge up but then it's stable for about six to eight hours so yeah uh, i think the new face plates are like this yeah yeah. Uh, they, uh, they take a lot of time, but then it's quite stable. Yeah. 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 So um, yeah, no, it's interesting to hear the hear the variation in that. Um, well, I um, just want to say thank you, Ludo, very much again for that interesting. Thank you. It was a pleasure. We'll invite our next speaker of the day, um, Sonia Welsh. So um, Sonia's um, the, uh, heads up the electron microscopy facility at the Max Planck Institute of Biophysics. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Sonia today because Sonia has only been enrolled for, well, essentially since the beginning of the year. So um, uh, having bringing lots of interesting prior experience from previous roles. So really, really interested to hear about your vision for the facility and, and what, what you've been doing. So I'll, I'll um, hand over to you, Sonia. Hello to everybody out there. <laughs> Thanks very much for the introduction. Thanks very much for the invitation. Um, yeah, I'm Sonia Welch. I'm uh, head of the EM facility at Max Planck Institute of Biophysics in Frankfurt. And as Becky just said, I only started doing this um, at the beginning of this year. So I probably have a bit of a rookie um, point of view on all this. And I'm really uh, curious to hear everybody's opinions and thoughts on the things we have implemented so far. Um, let me just briefly introduce the team and our instrumentation. So that's our team in front of our new microscope, the Glacios. <laughs> um, as you can see, four people, that's, at the, that's currently 3.6 FTE. And the reason is that Simonia and Suzanne, they both have small children at home and they both work 80%. And then there's Mark, the technician, and myself. And when I came here at the beginning of this year, that was the instrumentation um, in the building. So as you can see, two Titan cryots, two Technite 12 for screening, a Technite Polara, a GO3200, some yeah, cell biology tomography instrumentation for high pressure freezing and so forth, and some plunge freezers and a FIPSEM. And then during the course of this year, this has changed, sorry. A little bit, sorry. So that's what it looks like currently. We have um, added a bit more of instrumentation for cell biology ap applications, uh, cryoclem and archilos, uh, two Leica plungers. We've thrown out our Polara and replaced it with the Glacios. And we, just this week, we are in the process of throwing out this GO3200 to replace it with our third creos, which is due to be delivered at the end of this year. So it's a bit of a mess in the room at the moment. We currently have about 65 active users of our user levels. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna come to the what, what we do with them, to them, to these users. I think that's pretty much standard um, practical training at all user levels. Um, and then obviously day-to-day -day user support, the kind of thing that everybody knows that we try to help people get samples frozen, get I don't know, the samples screened, data, data acquired and so forth. We also do a bit of scientific support and in our case, scientific support really means that is project and experiment planning. Um, we are not so much involved in data processing at this point. Of course, we do um, offer data pre-processing on the fly, but data processing as such is really well covered at our institute within the departments and there is experts in the departments and also the processing pipeline, the hard and software is maintained by processing experts in the department. So that's not something we offer in depth at the moment, but that ne doesn't necessarily have to stay like this, but that's the situation at the moment. Instrumentation maintenance is obviously fixing stuff if we can and calling service if we can't. Uh, we also maintain the booking schedule. In our case, we use PPMS. We installed that this year and implemented it. Um, people like it so far. Um, and I'd like just like to make this comment that we also use PPMS for matchmaking between user requests and EM staff. 
maybe I should explain a little bit what we do here. We have implemented some you know, training request uh, forms and things like that. So people are forced in a way to let us know what they want to do and why and um, upload a bit of information. Uh, at least novice users and people who are not independent on the microscope yet. And that helps us to take a look at the requests and distribute them among um, EM staff. And then we prepare training material. I'd really love to hear people's opinion on um, or thoughts on that because currently training material or documents is something that we only started implementing here this year. Uh, we currently provide PDF documents in an internal wiki that we update regularly, but oh, yeah, I don't know, that's probably not the end of the line, not the um, latest and greatest. So I'd love to hear how other people do that. So from all these activities, I picked out two things that I would like to discuss in a tiny bit more detail today. The challenges that we are facing here or that I am facing, as I said, I'm relatively new to this. So there's one point on practical training that I would like to discuss and one uh, topic uh, regarding scientific support, the level of scientific support provided by EM facilities that I'd like to discuss. And before I go into this, there are two things I think you should know about this facility that are a bit specific about this place um, compared to others. Point one is that we do not have an external access scheme. We have no visitors. Everybody in our institute, or all users in our institutes are internal users or at least close collaborators. That also means that everybody is in theory trained by EM staff here at the Institute. So in principle, everybody should be doing the same. And um, the other thing I should say is that we have multiple users who've been here for five years or even longer. People are very loyal to this Institute apparently. So we have many people who have accumulated expertise over the years and that might deviate a bit from what in, an, in a facility you would assume is um, best practice. And the other thing I want to mention is that the entire lab design, um, the setup and design has been done by Derek Mills who yeah, built this place if you wish. And he's really done it in such a way that I have to say, I'm still stunned every day by you know, the conditions we have, the humidity and, and temperature stability conditions we find here. So we have exceptionally forgiving lab conditions and that plays into one of the points I want to bring up. And we have many custom-made solutions. You see that here on the, on the right-hand side, we have this custom-made eight auto grid boxes. And then we have all these Vitrobot um, accessories and um, loading station accessories that are made in-house in our workshop to, to fit, you know, to match um, these eight auto grid boxes. And there's pros and cons to this that I would like to discuss. So, sorry, clicking the wrong button. So best lab practice, that's point one that I would like to discuss. So what degree of freedom in user adaptation of protocols is acceptable from a facility point of view, but also from a user point of view, I guess. I mean, how much freedom do people want to have or need? Um, and I want to bring up this, this one example here, sorry, um, with the custom-made VitroBot accessories. I'm trying to get this Q&A window out of the view, sorry with these custom-made VitroBot accessories, because these accessories, and you see that here on the left, uh, these, these grid boxes that you've seen, they, they, they enforce a special protocol for ethane cooling and plant freezing. And it's just one of many examples here that the, the way the VitroBot is used here um, with these, these uh, large stands for the large eight uh, auto grid boxes prevents users from using this eight-legged spider and the floating ring in the VitroBot. And when I came here, I thought, this is madness, you know, this can't work, potentially can't work. And I still think there is a bit of a safety hazard to it, potential surface ice contamination, at least in a normal lab environment, potential vitro trees are damaged, safety hazard because people are also forced to freeze the ethane, to liquefy ethane in a separate container and then move it over. Um, that's not ideal. So the way we handle this now, or the way I handle this now at the moment is that 
you know, I, I follow this idea of those who might make nice grades are by definition, right? No matter if they follow the procedure I wish them to follow or not. I have to admit that I might be a bit dogmatic on you know, how to use a vitro pot after all those years teaching people on behalf of Thermo Fisher how to do that. So that's uh, the stand I have uh, ad adopted now. But new users um, are trained to follow the regular protocol. And it's important for me that all users must understand that the MPI way of working is unusual. So if they ever go out there in the world that they understand that what they have been doing so far is not normal. And the goal, of course, is to um, use the instrumentation most efficiently. I'd love to hear how other people handle this. People who have special protocols are successful, but are doing things in a funky way. Um, and then the other question I wanted to bring up is um, what level of user support do you think user support by facility staff is useful and healthy? And the reason why I bring this up is because here at MPI, I see, and I think that's true for pretty much every institute, that the level of guidance for students from peers and PIs, it really varies significantly between research groups. I really have to say that I'm impressed with the excellent supervision that most people, most users um, receive at MPI, but there is a smaller group of people with little or almost no guidance. And you also want those people to be successful and to use the microscopes efficiently. And I, I'm really not, still not sure how to, how, to what level I want to be involved or I want my team to be involved in their supervision. So the stance that we have taken on now is that um, where needed, uh, we do regular group meetings with the M staff. For one group, we have implemented this now to provide guidance and also to trigger a discussion because we really want people to use microscopes efficiently. And um, if, if, it, if that's what it takes um, to sit together with people and replace the group meeting, okay, so be it. I'm just not sure if this is normal or not. If people think this is crazy or everybody does that, I'd love to hear that. All novice users um, have in our case, provide a summary of what they've done so far and an outlook for the next experiment through the booking system. So we know what they're up to do and where they are at this point. And then I think that helps us a lot to decide whether the next step makes sense or if we need to sit down um, in many cases in a one-on-one -on -one discussion to plan the next microscope session. And then for everybody who is independent, we just provide the normal, you know, the normal user support that is nothing special. And again, the goal for me or for us is most efficient use of instrumentation. But maybe there's something I'm overlooking here. So I'd, I'd really love to hear your thoughts um, on the pros and cons of protocol variations in a shared facility. What you think are useful levels of user support or other topics, if you can think of anything that I brought up and didn't discuss in enough detail. But for now, thank you. I'm open to all kinds of questions. That's great. Thank you so much, Sonia. That's a really interesting um, insight into how you're thinking about tackling some of these challenges. And I know that there are many people on the call who um, who are who probably have uh, who are either working through these things or uh, you know um, yeah have have some experience. So um, just kicking off the the conversation that I was really interested to hear about how you've been thinking about the training material. And I, I think one of the things that you described in terms of having an internal wiki, having online PDFs. I mean, that's certainly um, the, the model that I know lots of facilities have been using, certainly the model that I know my facility has used. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the challenge with that is A, keeping them up to date when yeah. you have new changes in software and things like that. But we're now finding um, having to shift to do, because at the moment we're unable in Leeds to deliver face-to-face -face training. Um, so we're now starting to have a look um, at how we can develop additional resources and those are um, videos, all of those kinds of things. Um, are there any facility managers um, in the audience who have any experience using resources other than sort of written PDFs who'd like to chip in? So um, uh, Marcus, I'm gonna allow you to talk. All right, hello. Um, 
So I don't know if it's very helpful for you, but one thing that we are doing on top is um, that we have basically a seminar, uh, a monthly or bi-weekly seminar, um, which in, in a, is, is partly for new users and partly also for experienced users. So one part is basically to teach them the, the theory and one part is um, where they also get uh, results and workflows from experienced users. So they can get more of feedback on how a good or a bad project might be running. Mm -hmm. um, and so far it's at least internally very well accepted. Um, and uh, often things pop up which, uh, which are for, for you as a, as a, um, as a person who normally gives a training so obvious um, that you don't mention them anymore. Um, but they become more uh, prone and knowledgeable than in these seminars as well. Maybe that's one point to know. Yeah. I, just to say, I think it's a really interesting point, Marcus. So that um, how do you provide that essentially background and high level um, information in terms of, you know, sensible ways to plan your projects and just kind of how to expect the progression. And then we go right through that spectrum, right down to this is specifically how I need you to transfer the grid from the Vitrobot uh, in, uh, arm into the ethane, because if you don't do that, you're going to cause the tweezers or yourself damage. So it's a really interesting, I think that we have a challenge that we have information across quite a large range to cover. Uh, and it's, it's how you tackle all, all points of that spectrum to give the users some information. Um, uh, Dimitri, you have your hand up. I'm just going to um, allow you to talk. I, um, I don't have an actually the good example myself of how to use the, another training material, but I wanted to mention that a couple of years at uh, m and Cecile Hebert from EPFL gave a very nice presentation how to use the new way of training for the users. They were talking about uh, the uh, basically using videos, how to create the uh, uh, virtual presentations and train better users. And I think it's quite an interesting stuff from them. I would recommend maybe to talk to her. She could give a good information about this. Mm -hmm. EPFL, to my understanding, working on a European project of how to move to the new ways of uh, training students. That's great. Thanks, Dimitri. And um, Sharon, um, you've had your hand up. You're allowed to talk now. You can unmute yourself. Uh, hi. Um, we have also, we are very similar to Sonia's um, facility in that we also have only uh, local users and a relatively small number, not as large as MPI. And we've been very challenged with the um, corona uh, events uh, for training. One thing we have is a uh, wiki page based by, on Confluence software where we continually upgrade the protocols for data collection, both for tomography and single particle, uh, collecting the best practice uses that the groups have experienced and being led by Nadavi Lod for single particle uh, using usage. And that's been very helpful because they can go on to, on the support computer where there is a, a, a live internet, they can go on to the wiki page and look at the, the most um, recent protocols and best practices uh, and always get up to the minute information. That's been very helpful. And then the other thing for basic training is we're using pan, uh, something called Panopto to do um, video, uh, video, new videos, training videos for basic uh, TEM instruction it's very challenging indeed and thank you it's a great it was been great presentation so far thanks sharon yeah i think that's um that's really interesting to hear that you're you're that sharon you have some kind of similar challenges to the ones um, which sonia is describing it seems to me and it has seemed to me for a few years now like as a community of facility staff and facility managers there is an awful lot of duplication of efforts going on because a lot of us keep and maintain these wikis um, and information, and it's an enormous effort to generate these um, uh, you know, this, these training resources. Um, and of course, there will always be local specific things which need to be taken into account. But I have wondered whether, as a community, there could be an opportunity um, for further sharing of these kinds of resources. And um, tomorrow, one of the breakout sessions is focused around EM training. So if you're not signed up to a breakout already and we're interested in joining the EM training one, um, we, we hopefully will be continuing that side of the conversation in more detail because, yeah, I think um, uh, 
the more we can share share the kinds of resources that people are developing, the easier it will be for everybody. And I guess that leads us nicely onto Sonia's um, point that you raised around what level of tolerance do you have for when people want to do things differently? And I was, um, and I think it's especially challenging, as you say, you've when you've I guess you've come into a facility, you're now responsible for all aspects of it, including the health and safety. And it sounds like you have a specific area where you have a, a concern. And from what you presented, I can see why there might be a concern there. Um, uh, so I'll be, I'm going to give my view and I'm going to be very interested for other facility managers to chip in here. And I know that there are also some lead users on the call, so they, they might write in the questions and answers whether they agree with this or not. But um, I must admit, from my facility perspective, it's been run as a dictatorship rather than a democracy in, a, in the nicest in the nicest possible way. And I guess it's, it's always difficult because you have that challenge of the relationship. As facility managers, you want your users to get the best out of the equipment. Um, and therefore, you do want to allow them freedom to be able to do things. However, um, I, I think um, it, it, in, in my view, if you have other protocols which are more robust, for example, from a health and safety perspective, I think I would say, it, and obviously it's environment dependent, but I would say it's perfectly legitimate to um, to impose mm. a particular way of, of doing it onto, in, yeah, on, onto a set of, onto users, because ultimately you are, you, you're responsible for the management and you have an enormous amount of experience with, with these things. And sometimes there isn't actually very good reason for variations in my experience. It tends to just be past precedent. And then when people move over, it's fine. But i um, interested to hear if anybody else wants to come in on that or Sonia. Yeah, I mean, I, I as I said, I, currently I just adopt the view that whoever is successful with what they are doing, if they can do that independently and don't ask me to help them do things in a funky way, I'm perfectly fine with that. And then maybe, you know, may, maybe that's a reasonable way for now to go about that but I, I it might bite me at some point and that's why I thought I'd bring it up. So I'm just going to bring in Felix here um, just because Felix has made a, a point in the text which I think is a good one. Uh, so what I said in the chat is was basically training new users is basically the easiest because then you just train them the way you want but the most difficult thing is when you have more experimented postdocs or even group leaders coming from different places who receive different trainings. And it's always hard to fit them to our settings, to our rules. And we used to say together with Vim that, yeah, re-education takes twice more time than actual education. Mm -hmm. because you first need to de-educate them, yeah, detrain them before retraining them in our settings. And I agree with Becky that you have at some point to run a bit as a dictator. You have to impose some way of doing things. Otherwise you can't you, you can't have have anything working properly. Yeah, I guess um I guess uh thinking about it with you with Sonia, you talking today to a facility manager audience predominantly, I think that it's potentially no surprise that there's been support in both the conversation and also the text for a, for a dictatorship. However, I guess, um, yeah, we should be aware that we're, we're all talking to fellow, uh, fellow facility managers here. So um, just as a final person to come in and comment, um, Tobias, you've just put something in the text. So I'm just going to invite you to unmute just so you can comment. Yes, hi. Um, no, thank you. I mean, it's been great to sort of hear all these things, but as one of the people who, when I started, used to be the person that would come in and do everything completely differently, um, the thing that I learned was that as long as I left things in the way that people were expecting to find it, then they tended to let me get away with it. It's the times when I'd sort of change things around and leave settings in a way that was unexpected for the majority of the users that they found the hardest. So if, a rule would be if they don't break anything, um, then in my mind, it would be okay if they could, if they did things their own funky way, as you say. Um, but then, um, you know, they actually leave it as standard so that the next person coming along won't even know how it was previously well, used. That is a given. Thank you very much. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
that's a great no, yeah that's a great point um and just as a final one because i i can't um i can't leave without having you comment on this the design of your labs did look um uh brilliant in the way that you were able to get live readouts of temperatures and things and things like that and environmental parameters are obviously so important for keeping the performance of the microscope stable um, I know that there are quite a few people on the call who are in the process of building new facilities. If you were to give some short pieces of advice to somebody who was building a new environment, which, um, and I know that this is, you know, we could fill a conference talking about this alone. What key piece of, of advice do you think you'd give? Low humidity in the preparation rooms. I think it's definitely worth the money. It makes everything so much easier. And um, control rooms with... Uh, daylight. That's something many people don't have and that makes such a huge difference. So having the control rooms a bit further up in the building and with daylight, I think those are the two key <laughs> points. As somebody with no daylight in their control room, I think that is excellent advice. <laughs> and, and out of interest, what humidity do you go down to in your prep room? Um, in, in theory, about 11 12 percent in reality depending a little bit on the temperatures outside we are around 15 to 18 which is still relatively low and we need to drink a lot <laughs> so yeah no that that's 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 brilliant um Great. Well, thank you so much again, Sonia, for that presentation and also for sparking so much interesting discussion and conversation. Um, hopefully we'll be able to take some of these points through into the breakout sessions tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. And if anybody does have any other comments for Sonia or questions, you can pop those in the Q&A and then Sonia can have a look afterwards. And I will pass over to Pascal uh, for the next session. Uh, so welcome, everybody, for the, uh, the afternoon session um, on uh, single particle sample preparation. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really uh, excited about this session because uh, I think it's really a crucial, uh, a crucial step in, uh, in a successful project uh, in structural biology in Quarium. So we are having uh, three speakers this afternoon and, um, and uh, we're going to start with Tom Burney. Um, so I'm really honored to, uh, to introduce you, Tom. <laughs> You're going to give us actually uh, help us explore the CCPM uh, vision and uh, new tools for Croem community. So we're starting a bit uh, with this topic, uh, thanks to you. And, um, and you're currently the leader of the CCPM uh, core team at the Science and Technology Facility Council, which is based, based in, uh, in Oxfordshire. And you're holding a PhD in NMR and protein dynamics uh, from the University of Leeds, which you obtained in 2008. And then you did a postdoc in X-ray uh, crystallography method development, um, supervised by Piet Gross at uh, Utrecht for five years. And um, and uh, yeah, so I think you're you <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. So yeah, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much, Pascal. Uh, that's a very nice introduction. And yes, as you mentioned, I'm a, a former alumni of Leeds, and I agree with. Uh, Becky's sentiments at the start of the meeting that everything in Leeds is brilliant, um, especially the Indian restaurants. So I'm very disappointed that we, we don't get a conference dinner tonight, but nonetheless, it's very nice to be with you virtually from my uh, conservatory in Oxfordshire. And um, yeah, I must confess, um, CCPM are not branching out into sample preparation. Um, we had to jiggle around the schedule a little bit. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about uh, software uh, and the things that we do at CCPM and hopefully how they can help uh, users um, and staff at our facilities. So um, to start with just a brief explanation of, of what we are. Um, so CCPM stands for the Collaborative Computational Project for Electron Microscopy. And as Pascal said, we're based um, at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Oxfordshire. So we're, we're near neighbours to the EBIC National Facility. Um, and we're hosted by the Science and Technology Facilities Council um, here in the UK. And the, the CCPs are a, a kind of family of initiatives in the UK. So there are 17 different CCPs across the whole spectrum of science in the UK. And they have a, a common theme, which is to provide software infrastructure on which individual research projects can be built. Um, so our CCP uh, supports users and developers in computational aspects of, of biological cryo-EM. 
And our three main aims are to try and help build and support uh, the EM uh, community, um, to support software users, um, and also to support developers of, of software. We're, we're a relatively young CCP, actually. We were uh, started in 2012. Um, and we've been funded by the MRC and, and Wellcome Trust Grant since then, uh, alongside um, income from selling industrial user licenses for our software. And I'm very pleased that recently our, our core funding from the Medical Research Council was renewed. So we're, we're gonna be in business until 2016, which is excellent news. The key thing about this is that it's collaborative. So we, we can't do this by ourselves. Um, we have lots of different partners um, on the RALF site um, in the UK and, and in, in the EU. And if you're interested in becoming a partner with us, then, then do let me know. So I wanted to start by talking about the, the, the three different things that we do. So we, we run a, a national conference, uh, we have a, a training program and we have a, a software suite. So I'll just kind of route through those three different things and give you an overview of those. So we were in a, a, a national annual conference for uh, method development in query M and we call this the, the CCPM Spring Symposium. Uh, looking at the names on, on this on the Zoom meeting, many of you have been here before, which is great and recognize lots of them. So this is a yeah, national uh, conference, it celebrates uh, new method development, both software and hardware uh, in query M and other recent developments. We've been running it uh, since 2015 um, and it's grown from 100 delegates back then to over, uh, well, nearly two and a half thousand delegates this year when we, due to COVID, had to swap it from our normal physical meeting uh, to an online Zoom meeting at the beginning of the, the COVID pandemic. And, and I think we're all very used now to uh, these Zoom conferences, but I, I just thought I'd show you some of the metadata we collected on our conference. It's quite interesting. Um, so we had um, over 3,000 online registrations. Um, typically, we, we expected about 300 physical attendees. We had nearly two and a half thousand unique views. Um, you can see here the breakdown by location. So the majority were in the UK, um, Europe and North America, but we had people tuning in from around the world. Um, and also what was very pleasing uh, for us was that the majority of people that, that tuned in watched everything. We were wondering whether people would dip in and watch isolated talks they were particularly interested in, but it seemed that people stuck around for the whole conference. And, Looking at the numbers in, in this, this uh, meeting, that seems to be a, a common trend, which is really good news. Um, and this, this, that was the, the trend for the first day of our conference and it was mirrored on the, the other four days as well. Um, so we plan to run a symposium as normal next year. Um, so the dates will be the, the 21st to 23rd of April. Um, Optimistically, we've booked uh, the conference center at Nottingham University, but of course, this is going to be dependent on COVID and we'll make a call um, in the new year, whether we run it physically um, or whether we run a hybrid conference. So, sorry, whether we run it physically as a hybrid conference um, with, with, with Zoom as well, or whether we do it entirely virtually. The other thing I wanted to mention about this is we've collated all the talks from the last uh, five years events and they're all on YouTube uh, to watch. And there's some really, really good talks uh, to see there. You can see the playlist links uh, on, our, on our website if you're interested. Um, the second thing I wanted to uh, talk about is our, our training program. Um, so we, we run uh, many different uh, workshops uh, on aspects of computation for OEM. We've hosted more than 20 workshops now since uh, 2014. Uh, the majority of those have been uh, uh, at our home laboratory at RAL, um, but we also do workshops at external sites. Um, so if you're interested in us coming and running a workshop uh, at your institute, do please get in touch and we can see what we can do. Um, so as such, we've, we've offered more than 40 days of training now. We've trained over 500 people, um, both academic and uh, commercial. Um, and we, we typically cover single particle reconstruction, self-atomic averaging, uh, and atomic model building and validation. Um, so um, we're obviously now 
due to COVID, we're looking to doing things online. And I just wanted to draw your attention to our next workshop, um, which is in collaboration uh, with Wild Chew at Slack. So we're running a, 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 an online workshop there uh, for model building. Um, so this will cover uh, automated model building, Buccaneer, uh, flexible fitting in FlexiM, model refinement, RefMac, uh, local map sharpening with lock scale, uh, interactive model building with Coot and atomic model validation. So my, myself and, uh, and the other folks from CCPM will be there to help tutor this alongside the developers of, of uh, these programs. Um, so if you're interested, do have a look um, on, on the website and you can register for it. The second meeting I wanted to, to draw your attention to is uh, we have a, a validation symposium uh, on the 18th to the 20th of November. So this will be query um, validation in the age of SARS-CoV-2 methods, tools, and applications. And this is one of the outputs of uh, a multi-site welcome trust grant um, that um, we've been a part of. Um, it's a, a virtual Zoom meeting again, so it's, it's free. There's no limit in the number of people that can register. Uh, and this will cover all of the most recent developments in uh, map validation, model validation, and map to model validation, uh, specifically uh, how this applies to uh, the SARS-CoV-2 structures. So it should be a really interesting meeting. So look out for that and we'll, we'll announce it soon. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is our software suite. Um, so the CCPM software suite is a suite of utilities for uh, CryoEM data processing. It's put together in a, a common Python framework that we um, maintain. You can uh, download it from our website. Uh, it's available for Linux or Mac. Uh, it's free for academic use and there's a small fee for commercial users. Um, the previous version got uh, over 1,500 downloads and there's the new version 1.4 is available now. Um, we welcome any bugs, feature requests, any feedback. Um, so do get in touch if you have any, any comments about that. Um, briefly, the, the, the suite of programs uh, contains everything from going from uh, 2D micrographs all the way through to um, model uh, refinement and validation. Um, so we have rely on as part of the suite for single particle construction. And we have several tools for map optimization and sharpening. Um, we have tools for docking and model building, tools for automated refinement, and then we have links into interactive refinement as well. And we've been working on a, a kind of one-stop shop for model validation, CSPM, uh, model validation task that can help uh, validate your models at the end. So um, I don't have time in, in this presentation to go into uh, full details here, but if you're interested in taking a, a deep dive into the CCPM software suite, then uh, my, my fellow CCPM, Colin Palmer, gave a really nice long overview of the software uh, as part of the SB Grid Consortium lecture series last year. So um, you can have a look on there and see full details. Um, one thing I, I wanted to mention for facilities that we've been involved with, that Colin has been um, working with Takanori and Shores uh, to help develop the Rely on It uh, Python pipeline um, for on-the-fly processing. And this has been very useful for automating image processing and giving fast feedback for microscope sessions. And it's been used now at a, a number of query facilities, including EVIC. Um, and although it's been very successful, its, it's use is, is somewhat limited. Um, so in collaboration with Shores at the LMD, um, Matt Adanza, uh, along with Colin Palmer, have been working on a, a new, um, much more fully featured Python API for Reliant. And for those of you going to the, the software uh, processing pipelines breakout session uh, tomorrow, Matt will give uh, some more details about this. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about some recent what we've been doing is we've been working uh, with Andrea Thorne's project, uh, the Coronavirus Structural Task Force. Um, so she's leading a project to take structures that uh, are related to SARS-CoV-2 um, and re-refining these structures to make them as, as good as they possibly can be. 
Now we know that uh, the, the, these structures are incredibly important at the moment. Um, and it's great that she's managed to put together a team of experts who can revisit these structures and, and try and make them as, as, as good as they can be. So Agnel Joseph from the uh, CCPM team has been doing this um, and he's been applying the new validation tools he's made to these structures. Um, and you can get all of the information from this from Andrea's uh, website, you can see here. So I just wanted to highlight one example of one of the things that, that Agnel has been working on. So he, he took the, um, one of the structures uh, of the spike um, protein. And this is obviously very interesting. It's a key target for vaccines and therapeutic antibodies. And he took this uh, deposited structure and using some of the tools in CCPM, uh, in particular log scale, he could improve the map. Um, and then in combination um, with some related crystal structures, he could extend the model and add a, an extra 150 residues to it. Um, so, um, yeah, as I said, he used Logscale to do this along with Chimera, Ku, and RefMac. Um, and then he validated it using more property, Kablam, Ku, RefMac, and Tempe. Um, and these, these programs are all available within the, the CSPM suite, um, with the exception of Chimera, but the CSPM suite is designed to work with Chimera so it can push results onto to Chimera for, for easy viewing and analysis. Um, so uh, one final thing I wanted to, to mention is that we have a few open positions now in the group. Um, so we were pleased that we got a, a grant from the Alan Turing Institute to look at molecular structure uh, from images under physical constraints. Uh, this is a, a, a multi-site grant uh, in collaboration with the University of Cambridge, um, the MRC LMB, um, Turing and UCL. And it, it looks to try and get improved priors for 3D map reconstruction and also for collating rich metadata uh, for new machine learning based tools. So we've got two uh, postdocs open at the moment, one in uh, Shores' group at the LMB and then one uh, with us in the CSPM group at RAL. Um, you can see the, the deadlines at the end of the month. So if you're, if you're interested, um, to encourage you to, uh, to apply. And if you have any, any questions, please get in touch and ask me offline and I can give you more details about it. So with that, I think my 15 minutes is about up. So I just want to acknowledge all of the members of the, the CSPM core team um, and all of our collaborators uh, as well. And um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, you covered a lot in uh, 15 minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, we uh, have got uh, actually already a first question on, um, uh, from Marcus uh, to uh, see if uh, you're looking to incorporate CryoSpark in, uh, maybe it's a bit uh, controversial, <laughs> you're trying to integrate so many software. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I, uh, we don't have any plans to, so um, we, we only really incorporate software that we can work directly with. Um, so we, you know, if, if people write programs and they'd like us to help support and distribute as part of the suite, then, uh, yeah, do reach out to us. But I think in the case of CryoSpark, they're, they're pretty self-sufficient. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, it was especially, yeah, asking, uh, because of the, uh, the conversion of the program. So, uh, basically if I just read the end of this question, say, especially asking because it's still often a hassle to convert format between various, yeah, processing program. But uh, yeah, I think that's that's the whole point of uh, integrating. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if there's um, obvious things missing, especially kind of format into conversions, then that that's something we could look at. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. I think someone already uh, replied a bit to help out. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, I had a, a bit of a, of a question. I think you, yeah, you already uh, touched on uh, about uh, how uh, really CCPM helped in this uh, the, the whole uh, deposition of uh, data for coronavirus, and um, so this was done in collaboration then as well with uh, the EBI or that's what you mentioned. Oh, you, do you mean uh, the coronavirus task force? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that's done. Um... 
by Andrea, uh, originally in Würzburg, and now she's just moved to Lab to Hamburg. Um, and this was something that she put together herself um, with, with several other developers um, and kind of expert users, because um, uh, as I was saying in the, in the presentation, that these structures are so valuable that they need to come out as soon as yeah. possible to the community. Um, and they're, they're so big and complex, it's not surprising that there are potentially some areas of the structures that can be improved when one has more time to consider them and, and yep. build extra things. Um, so it's, it's really her, um, her work and, and her thing that she put together, but she asked us to be involved um, and to help um, use some of the tools in our suite. So Agnel Joseph from the group has worked closely with her. He's our kind of validation expert. Uh, and he, he wrote the, the validation task in CSPEM. Mm. Um, and he, he's also done some of the rebuilding uh, for the Crow EM structures that are part of her, her database. Yeah, no, I was, uh, yeah, I was totally uh, super pleased to, uh, to see that this was all happening. And uh, yeah, it was amazing that uh, you could use already what you had in place to to uh, to help out immediately yeah so yeah really uh, really amazing work <laughs> yeah um we have a, a next question on uh, the 2021 symposium so yeah you really uh, showed really nicely how making now meetings on uh, on zoom uh, or other online platform can uh, can really help to uh, to uh, to reach out to more people but some people are still asking yes felix if um in 2021 uh, you would be planning to do it uh, online or is there still hope for also physical venue what's the situation at the moment what's the yeah so <laughs> well as i guess you know the, the COVID situation in the uk isn't looking very promising at the moment so we have we have a uh a three state system or three a three part plan a three tier plan actually if we're going to go by the government so what we plan to do in ccpm is if everything goes back to normal fingers crossed then we will have a physical symposium in nottingham like the pre-covid days but we will run it as a hybrid meeting so we will have uh, the lectures broadcast over zoom so for people who are unable to come, you know, for time or cost or, you know, any other restrictions, parental care, um, then they can still participate in the meeting. But we still, still feel that the, the physical meeting has a lot of benefits um, that you, you can't replicate on Zoom. So if everything's fine, we'll do this. Um, if, if the situation is unstable um, and there's still travel restrictions, then we've also booked um, the, the lectures theatre uh, on our site and we would have a kind of small local meeting so you get a physical element mm. with that and again would still be hybrid and run on zoom and then if, if things are still not looking good uh, and we can't travel then yeah we'll just run it virtually again um, but yeah I mean we, we found that running it virtually this year was very successful and yeah, we, we plan to have the symposium as a, as a hybrid meeting, you know, forever more now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I know it's fair enough. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I think you replied really uh, well to the question. Really sorry, do you mind if I ask the question, Pascal? Go for it. I was already uh, expecting to be told up for the time. Or... <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got a couple, couple of minutes. I'm going to squeeze the last one in. Um, from a facility pipeline perspective, one of the things we've been thinking a lot about recently is how we should invest in our computational hardware in the future to support what we're doing software wise. I wonder from a CCPM perspective, because you have so much experience bringing in software from different types, whether you have a feeling for the direction of travel in terms of physical versus cloud computing resources. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I don't know for sure um, is the answer. It, it depends what, ac what, 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 what access you have locally. Um, I mean, there's no reason why these things can't run on, on cloud computing. Uh, it's something we're looking at. Um, one of the things we're working on at the moment is we're, we're putting together a, a suite of benchmarks uh, for Cryo EM. Um, and once we have these, and by benchmark, what I mean is uh, a kind of 
self-contained capsule that includes um, real uh, data, by real I mean large difficult data sets, not B-scale right of um, The algorithm that, that uh, runs it and then expected metrics and then in collaboration with the scientific machine learning group in, in SDFC, then we're distributing that to the, the hardware and software suppliers so that they can give more, uh, yeah, more rich answers to these kind of questions. Um, so that will help. But yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, um, one of the machine learning uh, sort of things on the horizon is these, these dedicated machine learning architecture chips that, is, again, is another interesting development. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I'm not sure at the moment. That benchmarking project sounds like it will be really, really beneficial. Certainly from our perspective, one of the big challenges is you look to buy something and especially as a non, you know, I would class myself as a not certainly a non-specialist um, is, is seeing how it perform in the real world. So that sounds amazingly beneficial. Be yeah. really interesting to see that data. No, thanks. I mean, it's, it's something that we're, we're, we're interested in and it's been nice talking to the instrument manu the, the hardware manufacturers because they're they're very interested you know intel nvidia they they want to support um our community um but they need a hand doing it and they need to know exactly what what we run and what problems we face are so yeah no i think it'll be interesting thank you so much Tom. uh yeah it was a great uh, great talk thanks thank you. so yeah thanks so um, yeah, we are gonna um, now uh, hear from uh, Michel Darrow uh, about a new generation of uh, CRELIM uh, sample preparation uh, instruments. So uh, really excited about, hear about hearing about that. And um, thank you, Michel, for coming today um, to to introduce you uh, just uh, briefly. So you um, basically received your PhD in cryo-electron um, and uh, soft X-ray tomography from Baylor College uh, of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Then she completed a postdoctoral position uh, at Diamond Light Source on uh, Beamline B24 that uh, a, a lot of us know about where she had uh, to develop cryo light X-ray and electron uh, techniques. So uh, Michelle is now a development scientist as, at uh, SPT LabTech, uh, where she works uh, in a team of engineers and researchers to develop uh, the chameleon system that she's gonna present now. So thank you uh, so much for joining us and uh, I'll uh, let you uh, start your presentation, Michelle. Thank you for that lovely introduction, um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, apologies for any background noise. My dogs have been quietly sleeping for the past three hours and then decided just now to take them outside and start barking. So, Okay, so I'll jump straight into this. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Chameleon today. So just a quick overview. I'm going to give an update on where the Chameleon system is right now with a brief description. Uh, and then I'm going to jump straight into some recent community results. Uh, and kind of give an update on some publications that have come through recently. So, okay, so before I play this, this is a video, so apologies if it kind of stutters um, or whatnot, but if uh, anyone is interested in it and it isn't coming through for them, it's available on YouTube or on our website. So just go to sbtlabtech.com and find the Chameleon page and you'll be able to see this exact video. So with that, I'll go ahead and hit play. Okay, so Chameleon hopes to automate plunge freezing for single particle cryo-EM. So this is mainly an animation just to show the different parts. We have two main robots, the tweezers and the dispenser, a cryogen drawer in the middle and a high humidity shroud. You'll notice this is the new glow dish charger on the left here. Um, the cryogen bowl has liquid nitrogen level sensing and ethane temperature control. So the discussion previously about keeping the temperature of the ethane consistent is fairly moot with this because it's done for you. Um, and then also just because I missed it, there are a couple of cameras built on to the instrument so that you can assess things as you go. So this is now the dispenser aspirating your sample from this temperature controlled sample block. There's kind of a, a wipe pad so that you can remove any excess. 
And this is one of the cameras that allows you to actually see the dispensing of the sample from the dispenser. When you're happy with it, it goes into the high humidity shroud so that it doesn't dry out. We use self-wicking grids. So these are specialty grids with nanowires on them. You can see we can load in eight grids at a time right now. Uh, each grid is picked up from here and placed into the glow discharge unit where you can glow discharge up to four grids at a time. Um, right now, this is negative charge in air only. Once the glow discharge has been performed, the grid is picked up and then immediately used by the system. You can do this in two ways. One is with a test stripe followed by a plunge stripe, and the other one is just to plunge directly. In either case, a stripe is put onto the grid as it moves past the dispenser, and then the nanowires that are on these self-wicking grids cause the liquid to wick into a thin film. Um, as it's moving uh, past the dispenser, it goes past a camera and then into the ethane. So this means that we again get a look at what the grid looks like just before it was frozen. So this allows us to choose whether or not to accept or reject that grid based off of what it looks like just before it was frozen. In the case that you choose to accept it, it will be dropped off into one of these uh, auto grid containers for you. And then the tweezers are defrosted uh, and then the whole uh, cycle can start again. So that's the basic idea of the chameleon system. Um, and all of the main components. So I'm happy to answer questions about some of the details, or like I said, this video and all the specifications of the system are available on our website. So with that, I'm actually just gonna transition directly into some recent publications from the community. All of these were done uh, by other um, institutions who have access to a chameleon, um, external to SPG LabTech. So the first one that I'm gonna talk to you about came from NYSBC um, with Misha Kopilov. And the structure here is of DNA pole data, in, which is active in translation DNA synthesis. So this is the first structure of DNA pole data, and it's both in the act of DNA synthesis and without DNA. So they were able to capture both, um, which is really exciting because it allows them to identify features that impose high fidelity in nucleotide incorporation, but also accommodate mismatches and lesions during extension. So from a, a development perspective, like as a development scientist at SPT Lab Tech, I thought this study was really quite interesting because they had a preferred orientation um, issue with both the complex, which you can see on the top here, and the APO state on the bottom here. So you can see when they originally did these data collection um, sessions, they get some pretty strong artifacts um, in their, their 3D models. And when you look at the sphericity values, they're relatively low um, for, for these structures. So then they kind of thought, you know, what do I do next? So a lot of people kind of think, I'll try tilting the stage and see if that uh, fixes the problem. So they took the APO state of the pole data complex um, on a VitraBot with a 40 degree stage tilt, so a pretty aggressive stage tilt. And they collected in, these, in this way for five separate sessions uh, with 1.8 million particles, so very large number of particles, a lot of time went into this. Um, after that, they went through the full process. You can see that their, their final 3D model looks much better. They were able to ameliorate the preferred orientation. Their sphericity value is good. Um, and their total, their final resolution is 4.1 angstroms. But you'll also see here that they only used about 17% of the total particles that were collected, so a little over 300,000 of the total particles um, out of those five sessions. So within the same paper, they tried, uh, instead of doing that, the 40 degree tilt, um, they looked uh, at the pole zeta complex um, in its entirety now on the chameleon. Um, and so you can see in the final iteration here, they did two sessions total. Um, they collected 206,000 particles essentially, and then went through a processing run and they ended up keeping 75% of all of the particles that they collected. Their uh, preferred orientation is completely gone with a decent sphericity score, and they're sitting at around 3.2 angstroms here. They did some additional uh, refinements that got them down closer to three angstroms, but just straight off of the chameleon here with 75% of the particles that they collected, they were able to get down to 3.2 angstroms resolution. So there's an example of preferred orientation comparing 
uh, the vitrobot, the vitrobot with a tilted stage, and then also the chameleon system. So now I'm going to transition to a second story here. So this one um, is using pre-sequence protease or PrEP. And this comes out of the lab of Wei Jing Teng in uh, Chicago, but in collaboration with NYSBC, so Bridget and Clint, um, Alex Wei. So uh, pre-sequence protease is a uh, mitochondrial metalloprotease, which um, is vital. Um, it degrades pre-sequence peptides. Uh, and uh, this is especially um, important for things like A beta and other aggregation diseases. Um, so, this paper was able to finally show the first structures of apoprep in the open states and with a substrate bound, which is quite exciting um, for cancer and other treatments. So, if we jump into this again, they did a pretty direct comparison here where they're looking at prep on the vitrobot. And they found that it dissociated and denatured pretty consistently. So um, I'm actually going to quote almost directly from the paper because they uh, literally say these things in it. And it's, it's kind of, it's interesting to kind of hear the researchers in their own words and how they, they found um, using the system. So Here's the uh, 2D class averages from a vitrobot. And you can see that they end up with three classes when they do their models. Um, two of them are missing at least some of, if not the entirety of the C-terminal domain. Um, one of them, it does have it present, but this represents only 12% of all of the particles that were collected as part of uh, this process. They did do some tomography to try to understand a little bit more about what's going on, and they found that all of their particles were um, at either the top or the bottom of the ice. They had very few particles actually embedded in between. And so from that, they uh, essentially inferred that the um, C domains are preferentially absorbed to the air water interface, and that this exposure is likely what's causing the preferential denaturation of the C terminal domain. Um, essentially, they tried many different ways to go about this. So they say that they tried different buffers, they tried using differential scanning fluorimetry to identify better buffers here. They tried adding different substrates, so the A beta that we talked about before to lock the prep into the closed state, or altering the grid properties, so graphene, all of those tricks that a lot of people try when they find that the vitrobot doesn't quite work on the first go. And in this case, all of them failed to properly vitrify their uh, complex. Uh, and that's when they transitioned to the chameleon system and collaborating uh, with NYSBC. And so here you can see that they put it onto the chameleon system. Uh, they used 133 milliseconds dwell time, which is um, the fastest that the system at NYSBC can go. Uh, and following classification, all of the classes were found to contain full length prep particles. No denaturation was observed. So in this case, it's not just that the denaturation or the dissociation was ameliorated, but it's completely gone in their analysis. Um, because of that, they were able to show 3D class, uh, classes of three different states. Um, and then they also went on to look at two substrate bound states as well, um, which is really quite exciting. So then the last example that I'm going to talk about today um, is related to SARS-CoV-2, of course. Um, so this work comes out of uh, Diamond and out of the Rosalind Franklin Institute. Uh, and they're looking at uh, nanobodies from a camel uh, that were found to bind to the receptor binding domains of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, blocking interaction with the ACE2 receptor. Um, so in this case, there were no preferred orientation issues. Uh, there were no you know, air-water interface problems, not dissociating, no major issues with the sample uh, other than kind of inconsistent preparations went on a vitrobot. And so chameleon was used to overcome sample preparation issues such as uneven ice thickness and to provide re reproducible ice, ice quality. Um, and so in this case, uh, the feature of being able to see uh, an image of what the grid looks like before it goes on to a microscope was really handy because you knew out of your freezing session that you're going to end up with something that has good ice on the grid. 
Um, and so this was a fairly standard data collection and data processing uh, setup, from my understanding, after they were able to overcome these uh, uneven ice issues. Um, and they were able to get um, some nanobody attached to the spike protein at, I believe, 3.7 angstroms resolution in this case. Okay, so uh, with that, I'm just going to go ahead and put these images up. So these are all of the chameleon published or open structures as of this morning when I finished making this talk. Um, so some of them we've talked about today. Um, some of them are published uh, and we didn't talk about today. Um, others are just available. They were test subjects that were done um, when a system was delivered maybe to a different um, location or just to ensure as we've been going through that we're, we're getting what we expect. Um, and then I think Steve is also going to talk about a couple of these examples. And we're just really excited uh, from the perspective of SPT Lab Tech to see the system being used by the community, uh, kind of with us, you know, being more hands off and also um, just to kind of see what's in the pipeline and coming up soon. So with that, I'll go ahead and just leave this up and uh, thank everyone for their attention. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Michel. Thanks for keeping it on time. And uh, yeah, it's very impressive. The, the video uh, worked <laughs> a bit slowly at some moment, but I think uh, we all made it so we could see it. Um, yeah, we uh, have um, already uh, a good couple of questions. Uh, I think we all have this also kind of technical question that's great to start with. <laughs> um, basically, if uh, the chameleon works as well with pre clipped grids or not. I'm sure yes. you've done something. So, no, it does not. We do not freeze pre clipped grids. The grids that we freeze will then have to be clipped in order to be put into a microscope, which requires clipping. Also, in terms of sample preparation, uh, concentration of samples, so that's a, another question. Um, uh, so, yeah, compared to a classic uh, other plunger, uh, do you change the concentration of your sample? Yeah, you definitely need to change the concentration in order to work on a chameleon, especially at high speeds. So um, there's some work that will be coming out of MIT in the near future, hopefully, that will be uh, really useful to elucidate these trends. They essentially have taken the same sample, the same prep on the same day, and frozen it at multiple different time points and also multiple different um, concentrations. When I say time points, I mean wicking times. Um, and they see different concentrations of protein in the uh, embedded in the ice. Um, so Sti, I think, might also talk about this a little bit in his talk because we did some uh, work with leads uh, to show the similar ideas. So the basic idea here is that you do need a higher concentration of protein the faster you plunge. Um, so you kind of have two options then. You can uh, aim for as high of a concentration and then plunge as fast as you can. If you can't increase the concentration high enough that that's uh, useful, you get enough particles per image, um, you can kind of increase your data collection. So you need more images, but you get higher quality particles in every single yeah. one. Or you can slow it down just a little bit. So we've seen that it's kind of a continuum so if you plunge at 54 milliseconds, which is the fastest that you can go on a chameleon, you have the fewest particles, but the best chance of them being good. Um, but if you can't accommodate that, you can maybe back off to you know, 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds, and you'll still see the improvements, some of the improvements um, for most particles that we've tested, and you'll have more of them per image. And just for range, I mean, are we talking tenfold more protein or? Yeah, so this is a hard question for me to answer because it's not published, but uh, yeah, I mean, not even just because I, guess, I don't know if we can. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, not even just because it's not published yet. It's because it's different for different proteins, right? And so this is something that I think the community is going to need to weigh in on, right? Because I can't test, you know, hundreds of samples for this uh, internally, like within SPT Lab, like SPT Lab Tech. So we're going to need the community to do some of this and publish some information and some trends. I would say that the biggest thing is speed. So uh, if you want to go, um, if you want to go 54 milliseconds and you normally use like one mg per mil uh, on a vitrobot, for example, I would say you probably need to be at maybe like five mg per mil. But 
also have uh, like another factor that can play into this and that's the size of the protein. So yeah. seeing that the concentration does vary depending on the size of the protein, I would guess that there's also other components uh, or other features of the protein or the complex that you're looking at that will play into this in some way. And so that's where it becomes a lot more difficult to actually test this and tell you the exact trend. Um, okay. I think the jury is still a little bit out on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll try to squeeze a few more questions, but we are running a bit uh, low on time. Um, but uh, in terms of um, uh, automatization of uh, the machine, um, so could you tell us, so is it something that's automatically calibrated in terms of the position, you know, where it needs to go? It looks like there was a lot of, uh, you know, it needs to be very precise. So is this going to be uh, calibrated by an engineer on site or is it automatically calibrated? If you could try to reply quickly and then we can. Maybe yeah, that's on. taken care of during installation and commissioning. So it's taken care of by us as soon as it's set, it should not need changing and we reduce as many interactions as possible. So the user should never touch the tweezers. They're cleaned and dried and taken care of uh, for the user. And same thing with the dispenser. So because of that, it's consistent, the positioning. Um, in the next uh, kind of uh, trend as well of questions is uh, really about how many basically grid square can you get there that are actually good over the whole um, over the whole grid. So with basically if I just read the question with the current uh, fast K3 data collection, uh, how long until the stripe is completely exhausted? In the absolute worst case scenario, that's when the column lines up with the stripe and you have kind of one or two columns on the stripe, you end up with around 20 squares. In most situations, it's a bit more random and you end up with anywhere between 20 and 40 squares. Um, the whole size, so um, it's 1.2 microns with a uh, two micron center to center distance between. So they're a bit more crowded than you would find on like a, um, a quantifoil, like a 1.2, 1.3. This is more like a 1.2, 0.8. Um, and so there's probably, I think 500 or so, uh, maybe a few more uh, holes square. Okay. And Thank you'll you. do math to figure out how long that will last depending on your- No, that's perfect. No, that's good. That's yeah, good. exactly. <laughs> well, really uh, like uh, an idea what to, what to expect. So that's what you yeah. would do. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, also about the grids. So we need special grids. Uh, so could you just tell us a bit more about those grids? How well would they uh, perform in terms of drift uh, compared to uh, all the gold grids? Uh, and also a bit about lead time. Uh, if you can tell us a bit yes, more. Yes, so about these, are, these are copper grids with nanowires grown on them, so they're not gold. Um, and then we put a carbon film, holy carbon film on them. So they're pretty standard other than the nanowires in terms of uh, like a quantifoil grid. Um, the nanowires themselves are copper hydroxide. So uh, we're not gonna get away from having copper bars present on the grids because they're necessary in order for the nanowires. So we can take that kind of normal copper self-wicking grid and put gold foil on it. And we do see improvements in stability just like everyone else when you do that, but we'll never be able to get rid of the copper aspects of it without kind of doing a pretty large research project into finding other ways of wicking. Okay, all right, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, the next uh, speaker, Stephen Munch. Uh, uh, and uh, Stephen holds a PhD in chemistry from the University of Sheffield and uh, then completed his postdoc um, in molecular biology at the University of uh, Leeds. Um, he then started lecturing in 2015 on membrane uh, biology and Stephen is now uh, associate professor at the University of Leeds, and his research group is especially interested in developing new um, scaffolding matrices uh, for membrane uh, protein, like the one there are from SMAPS, and uses uh, Korean in his, uh, his technique. So yeah, I can't wait to hear um, uh, more detail uh, on this uh, time-resolved um, plunge freezing. Um, and uh, I'll leave the floor to you, Stephen. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you for that really kind introduction, Sarah. 
Welcome everyone. I can't see everyone, but I'll assume everyone's still out there and not disappeared for an early coffee break. So what I wanted to talk about today was some of the work we've been doing over in Leeds on new approaches to grid preparation for cryo-electron microscopy. So I guess a lot of you are familiar with this already, which is a, a very old picture now from uh, Jacques Dubuche's pioneering work doing uh, cryo grid preparation, where you take your grid in some forceps, you blot away the excess solution and then plunge it in liquid ethane. And of course the field's moved on, we've got the Ritrobot now, which uses the same sort of approach, but gives you more consistency. And there's been some real groundbreaking structures solved by the Ritrobot. And in more recent years, there's been a few new approaches to grid preparation as well, be that the chameleon that we've obviously just seen all about. We've also got the crow writer from Thomas Braun's group that looks really interesting as well. And then of course is the Vitrojet as well by Peter Peters group, amongst other systems out there. And the goal of all of these systems is to give you, you know, high quality, reproducible cryo-EM grids. And I guess just to point out that that wasn't really the goal that we set out to achieve, nor is it what we did achieve in our grid making device. So what we want to do was not to just get consistency in the finished ice possible, but what we wanted was a machine that was capable of doing time resolve electron microscopy. So something a little bit different than what you've heard already. And so how do we go about this? Well, if we want to understand the molecular motion of an object, so in this case, a horse, we can simply take a series of snapshot of that object in, in motion, and then we can get two key parameters. The first is the order of the events, so the order in which each event occurs, and importantly, the time point between each of these events, which is determined by the aperture speed of the camera, of course. And when we put those two things together, then we can generate these beautiful molecular motion movies. So we can really understand the motion of an object with these two bits of key information. So of course we could trigger a reaction at ATP, for example, and then simply freeze the grids on a Vitrobot and we'd have a number of different conformational states. And then we could computationally try to piece these together. But the problem here is we don't know the order of the events and we don't know the time frame that links each of these together. And the other big issue we have is more often than not, what happens is that you trigger a reaction and then this reaction ends within, say, 100 milliseconds, far quicker than you would ever be able to make a grid on the conventional machine. So how do we go about getting these different conformational states with conventional electron microscopy? So these three key ways in which we can do this, there's the uh, light triggered approach. So we can take a caged compound block the grid as you conventionally would, and then you pass it via a light source, decage the compound, and then plunge it in liquid ethane to stop the reaction. And there's a really nice paper actually just by Eric Garo's group, I hope I pronounced that correctly, in the journal Structural Biology that came out sort of last week, the week before, and there's a really nice paper on this approach. So I do, you know, do check that out. Another way of doing this is by blotting the grid, then plunging the grid, past a sprayer which contains your substrate of choice, so maybe ATP, for example, or the classic Unwin experiment on the acetylcholine receptor as well. So this is a really nice approach. The danger here is that you don't always know where you've mixed on the grid, so you don't know quite where your substrate has landed on the grid, and that can create problems. Then the third approach, which I've shown here, is where you take a microfluidic device and you mix protein and reagent in a microfluidic device, and then you spray it directly on the grid. This ensures you've got complete mixing, but the problem here is how do you make droplets such that they can land on the grid and create usable ice? So this is the system that we've come up with. It's fairly basic, as you can see, it's pretty homemade because you can't buy these things off the shelf. So certainly not as nice as the chameleon setup. We don't have any flashing lights or any of the high-end sort of electronics, but we're, we're trying. So what we've done is begged and borrowed a little bit and got a lot of stuff from eBay. But the basic setup is this, we have some tweezers, we have a grid here shown by uh, nine, then we have these blotting arms here, so we can do blotting, we have a rapid mixing unit shown here, liquid ethane here where we've effectively stolen the, uh, the ethane cup from the Vitrobot. And then if we look on the left hand side, you have these two syringe drivers that push solution through the tubing into the spray tip. And then this here is our voltage. We can put a few thousand volts for the sample. And this is to give us voltage assisted spraying that can break up the droplets. So we don't need this anymore, but it did help in the early days and it can assist for some samples. If we turn it around, we have a humidity device. So 
we actually have the humidity chamber, which is made by a pump basically from a fish tank for about 30 quid, and you put it through some pressurized cylinders, and that generates a really good humidity chamber. And then to keep your facility manager happy and the health and safety people, then you can sell the tape a lunchbox at the back of it, and that protects all the electrical wires so no one gets electrocuted. And then we have a range of these new systems that we're we're trying. It, it's forever being developed. So now what we've got is four channels when the syringes are on, and then we're we're trying different things to speed things up and to try different sorts of sort of reactions, etc. So it's work in development. But this is, let's say, the old system. So this is just a, a movie, it's looping, we don't go up and down. But what you can see is we push solution through the syringe here, it's sprayed on the grid, and the grid is rapidly pulling from the liquid ethane. We can slow everything down on a high-speed camera, so you can see the grid passing via the tip here, which is spraying out our protein of choice onto the grid. Then we're plunging it into the liquid ethane to freeze the grid. So look away now, I guess, in terms of the, the quality of the grids, you can see when we first started out on this thing, the quality was pretty dreadful. So we have you know, very thick ice here or no ice at all. And then we have these little areas here which are usable. And one advantage of an EM grid is there's so much redundancy on there that you don't need to cover much of a grid to actually be able to collect a full data set. So we're able to get the apiferritin structure to around sort of 3.4, 3.5 angstroms when we first started out on this setup. We got the ribosome down to 4.2. We wanted something long and thin because we we're worried about the shear forces of the system. So we thought if we put something long and thin in, does it actually withstand the process? And it does, and we're able to get actin down. We've also been able to do sort of liposomes as well and some membrane proteins. And we've also been able to do GFP proteins and we can look at the, the full essence of those. But of course, all I've shown you at the moment is that we can make grids as you would do on the Vitrobot, albeit with probably slightly thicker ice. So what we really want to be able to do is some time resolved experiments. So going over to Hamburg, it was great to go over there because they have these high speed cameras. So we could actually measure really accurately the speed at which the droplets leave the tip. So we can work out the, we know the distance, now we know the speed and we could work out the plunger speed as well quite accurately. And that means we can now start to really work out what time delays we have in the setup quite accurately. And so in this mover here, what we're doing, you'll see the two syringes moving up, we're moving apiferritin and actin. They're mixing just in the tip here, being sprayed on the grid, then plunged in liquid ethane. And this whole process is 10 milliseconds from the time at which they first made contact to being plunged in the liquid ethane. And we could see them both on the grid at the same time. And the second experiment, what we've done is we pre-block the actin and then we pass this blotted grid through the spray and into the ice, into the ethane, sorry. And by doing this, we can again start a reaction and then, and then stop it. Although in this case, we're simply mixing two things. The ice is thicker and that's simply because we've blotted first before we've added an additional layer on with the spray. And so this isn't overly applicable to all systems, but I really like it in terms of being able to study, for example, a cell on the grid. If you wanted to pre-blot a cell on the grid and then pass it through some sort of solution, some sort of trigger, where trying to get a cell for a microfluidic device is pretty challenging. So we have a blotting approach for those big things that we wouldn't necessarily want to be able to squeeze through a microfluidic device. And so that process works as well. In terms of light triggered reactions, we've not really tried to do too much on that. We've, we've got enough on our plate as it is. But of course, have we got mixing or coalescence? So in order to understand that, we did a fairly simple experiment. We have actomycin S1, which is a filamentous system. And when you add ATP, you get dissociation of the mycin S1. And we know that within 10 milliseconds, if we have 800 micromolar ATP, all of it should be dissociated. 80 micromolar ATP, 70% should be dissociated within 10 milliseconds, assuming we have mixing. And when we do the experiment, we see that is true. So when there's no ATP, as expected, fully decorated filaments, as we increase the addition of ATP, we can see that the mycin S1 is dissociated. So we get these bare thin filaments. So we're getting mixing in the, in the setup, which is really good to see. We've gone on now to try some new sprayer technology. And this is again from Hamburg or the, the group have now moved to the States. And these new sprays are given as much nicer grids. And actually now, we're fairly confident when we, we can make these grids fairly easily now, and we can only get usable ice on the grids that we make. It's not as much of a potluck anymore, but we're getting much more consistent now with the grid quality. And these new sprays work really well. We get a nice plume of spray going on the grid. 
Again, we've been able to characterize the speed of the droplets, the diameter of the droplets, so we, we can get a handle of this. I won't bore you with, with the details. We've been able to, I think the highest resolution now is three angstroms on the nose, so we're getting there. Obviously, we're not at the 1.2 angstrong uh, aperferritin structures that are coming out at the moment, but that's not really the point of the experiment here. What we're trying to do is to mix things and look at conformational changes. So three angstroms for us is a doable resolution at the moment. The faster we go, the thicker the ice, and this is a challenge at the moment that we're trying to get around, and that's one of the fundamental problems at the moment that we're, we're trying to address, but we're, we're getting there. So I wanted to move on to sort of continue a bit of what Michelle talked about, really, and this was a, a study to look at the air-water interface. So we we noticed Bridget Carragher's really nice paper on the air-water interface and how the quicker you go, the more you can avoid interactions with the air-water interface. And in this paper, many of the experiments were done at 250 milliseconds, and we thought, well, we can probably go quicker than that, or at least indeed we can go quicker than that. So why don't we see if we can see a continuation of this effect? And so using the Vitrobot, TED is our time resolve device. We, we couldn't think of a better name, really. And then there's the chameleon as well. And, and huge thanks to Michelle for letting us use the chameleon so we could make sure that what we're looking at is a a feature based upon time and not just a feature of our machine being different than other machines. And so what we could see is that when we take apoferritin, we go from in a vitrobot blotted grid to having about 90% of the air water interface to maybe around 85% when we make the grids quickly. So a subtle difference in the amount of protein at the air water interface. With HSP60 or HSPD1 as some people call it, we have 100% of the air water interface when we do these grids in the Vitrobot. And this goes down to around 90% when we make these grids on the uh, TED device. And I'll talk a bit more about this later. Because science is science is always something that wants to disagree with you. And in this case, it's the ribosome. So for the ribosome, what we found was we had around 80% of the air water interface in the Vitrobot. And this actually got worse when we made the grids quickly. This might be a factor of the ribosome degrading, creating a protective layer at the air water interface. We're not quite sure this is still work in progress in terms of understanding what's going on here. So going quickly, you don't necessarily avoid interactions at the air water interface, but then that's not surprising given the speed at which proteins can get to the air water interface and back again, it's gonna be quicker than the millisecond time frame we're working in here. Well, can we alleviate some of the problems that we see as a consequence of the air water interface. And so in this instance, what we're looking at the orientations and preferred orientations. So here we have the Vitrobot, the chameleon at 200 milliseconds, 54 milliseconds, and our TED device here. So for the 30S ribosome, what we see is preferred orientation in the Vitrobot here. This is a globe plot of angular distribution in sort of concentration here. And this is alleviated to some extent as we go quicker. This is more pronounced for the 50S subunit where we have quite a preferred orientation here to some extent here as well. And again, this is alleviate to some extent here when we go quicker, although we do still see some preferred orientation. It is a little bit alleviated. The 70S seems to go in the opposite direction in that we actually probably have more angular view spreads here. And actually then we get a concentration of angular views here. Again, we're not quite sure why this is. This is work in progress. There's always some protein that wants to go against the rules. But I think for us, the real take home message and the thing that really surprised us was what happens to some of the subunits on the ribosome. So when we look at the full complex, what we see is that when we block the grids at six seconds, this L31 subunit is missing. It's also missing at 200 milliseconds on the chameleon. But when you make the grids at 54 milliseconds on the chameleon, the subunit comes back. And again, it's here at 13 milliseconds on the TED machine. When you look at just the individual 50S subunit, you can again see that the subunit is present in the quick time points, but absent when we make the grid slower. This is also pronounced here on the S2 subunit, which is on the 30S, which is totally absent in the blotted grids. So this is implying that the, the subunits are falling off in a time dependent manner. So our hypothesis at the moment is that the longer these proteins are sort of sat on this grid surface and the thin layer interacting with the air water interface, the more likely you are that these small ancillary subunits are going to, to fall off. So the quicker you can go, maybe the more you can protect from this effect. We see a similar thing here with the uh, HSPD1. So this is sevenfold symmetric. So we're only seeing one seventh of the globe plot. 
on the Vitrobot here, we have highly concentrated view. We only ever see the top view. We never see the side view on the Vitrobot. And we collect huge numbers of data sets on this. But when we go quicker and quicker, you can see here at six milliseconds, you see many more sort of views coming in in this central region here. You're starting to populate it with this sort of pink color here and, and less of a preferred orientation at the top. Albeit there is still a preferred orientation within it, you've alleviated it to some extent. What this meant was that when we then looked at our sort of reconstructions from 25,000 particles, it didn't look great. From 13,000 particles, but at 50 milliseconds, we could start to resolve these helices here, which you can't do here. So less data, but going quicker. And again, less data still, but going quicker still, you could also resolve these helices. This one is probably slightly perturbed by the thicker ice, which is why we've got slightly lower resolution there. What was interesting is actually in this case, we found that we can actually alleviate some of these problems by supersaturating the grid. So we use huge concentrations of protein more than we ordinarily would do. And that means we can then make blotted grids where we can start to see some side views by really increasing the concentration. It's, it's always gonna be sample specific, but in this case, it works as well. What that meant was that we could generate a structure from the blotted grid at about four angstroms and, and a similar resolution one from the, the sprayed TED grids as well. And intriguingly, what you can see here is that again, in the fast grid, you can see density for this region, these beta strands, but in the conventional one, you don't. And so again, there's a time dependence on some of the features that we're seeing in the map. So what's going on? We're still not 100% sure, but we're starting to get a bit of an idea as to what's going on. We have these interactions with the protein to the air water interface, and this is gonna be very quick, sub millisecond. So it's hard to really stop this from happening with conventional sort of approaches. We can get complete unfolding. And from here, we then get maybe a protective layer, which can help, or we may get partial denaturation at the air water interface or preferred orientation. And these events are gonna happen a bit slower in the millisecond time frame, and therefore we might be able to trap these by going quickly. We may need to go faster still, but certainly the quicker you go, the more you seem to alleviate some of these things. So very quickly, there's a few people I really need to thank. So Dimitrios was a post office a few years ago, and he managed to sort of help get the project going. David's just a very, very good PhD student who's just done a crazy amount of work for his PhD to really get this system working. Howard over here, I've worked with for over 10 years, building these machines who's just brilliant. Uh, Diana and Martin over in Hamburg for all their stuff for the spring. Becky, of course, uh, running the facility and anything else and all the air water interface stuff was done in collaboration with her and she was a huge help trying to understand tomography, which is something I, I hadn't done. And then just for the last few seconds, I just wanted to have a real shameless plug for the challenges in biological cryoelectron microscopy Faraday discussion, which hopefully will be face to face in July in Sheffield, we will see. And there's a link here, but what's really nice about this is because it's a discussion, it's not just about listening to people talk. Much of it is about discussing the challenges in EM and there's actually only ever going to be five minute talks or 10 minute talks. Much of the time is led to discussion. We've got people like obviously Chris Russo talking about his new sort of grids, which will be great. Thomas Braun, Dan, Claire, Becky. We've got loads of really good speakers. So please do check that out if you're interested as well. And uh, thank you for listening. Thanks for giving us so much detail. Uh on the application of the machine, on, uh, that's really amazing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a new era. It's gonna help so many projects who are really having problems with, uh, with, uh, with seeing their protein really. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's gonna be great. And, and actually to touch on uh, this uh, sample uh, specific question, there are also a few questions in the uh, Q&A on that. Um, so, do you, uh, do you have special buffer uh, also that you would say work better or are changing between the previous technique or not? No, we've not found anything yet with buffer. So we've never found that any one buffer works any better than any other at the moment. It seems to be, again, protein specific. So we've not, not encountered anything. We have tried a few membrane proteins because we were worried that detergents might yeah. get soapy. When you start to spray them out, you may end up with foam coming out the other end, but they seem to work relatively well. So we didn't see any problems with detergents in the buffers. No, that's good. And is there any uh, improvement in terms of ice fitness? So that's also a question uh, that uh, people were asking. And uh, I, I had the same question, actually, you know, like what, uh, what uh, really is a, another game changer in this technique? So 
question. It's on. really difficult, isn't it? Because I mean, A, what is the perfect ice thickness anyway? <laughs> That's something we don't always know. We're getting better in terms of having thinner ice. One issue we do have is that the quicker we go, the less time there is for the droplets to spread out on the grid. So this is why a lot of our data points are at 10 milliseconds, because although we can go at five milliseconds, the ice is generally a little bit thicker, but at 10 to 50 milliseconds, we, we get quite nice usable ice. Yeah. Never really tried to push the resolution. It's one thing we've got so many things on at the moment. What we've not done is sat down and made 100 Aper ferritin grids, changing the parameters to get the perfect one to get you mm -hmm. know, a sort of free angstrom structure. I, I just think life's a bit too short and it's not what we made the machine to do. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you know, I'm sure we could probably get higher resolution if we really pushed, but it's not something that we really designed it to do. Or yeah. have tried Over, to overall, is it quite re reproducible as well? Um... Yeah, it is now. In the early days, it, it was you know reproducible till we tried to do it again, kind of experiment. So it, we often found it was not great. But I mean, this is always the thing when you've had a student work on it as well, who's very talented for a few years. They have a good grasp of understanding the machine. Mm. And now, yeah, when people come, you know, and I should say if anyone wants to use the machine, you know, when people are allowed to travel again and visit the facility, please do, you know, feel like you can come. We don't have any IP on this, take pictures of it you know, and, and that, but we're generally quite confident that we can make grids that people can use in terms yeah. of ice thickness and things like that. That seems to work pretty well now. Okay. And is there a difference in terms of, uh, that's also a question um, that was asked. Um, is there an effect uh, of the droplet size to the preferred orientation of air water? Uh, it's a good question and we don't know is, is the honest answer. So it's something that we've looked into because the other issue as well is damage at the air water interface because small droplets, you have a much different volume to surface ratio. And so, you know, bigger droplets might be more protective. So it's things that we're looking into at the moment, but we don't have any answers for, unfortunately. Okay. Do you actually use uh, also the um, uh, the same uh, grid type then? So it's a special grid that you need to do it or special blow discharge, special grids? Or... No, so you can do this with conventional quantifier 1.2, 1.3 grids. Uh, you can use self-wicking grids as well because they will help because they will help the droplets spread out a little bit as well. So it's, but we have done this with conventional grids. It doesn't rely on a specialized grid, although I'm sure it's something we want to look into because I suspect through functionalization, we can probably improve the wicking abilities okay. and maybe be able to go quicker and get thinner ice. Yeah, uh, there is a question specific on the detergent, so I'm sure you'll uh, <laughs> like to hear to have this one. Uh, does a concentration of detergent and type of detergent affect the speed size of the droplets? So the honest answer is we don't know. We have a new PhD student and this is something that they're going to look at. So of course the surface tension is going to change as well when you have different detergents and so that's going to change the behavior of the droplets on the grid. So again, it's a good question. It's something we'd like to know how different sorts of detergents and concentrations affect the droplet dispersion, but we've just not been able to parameterize it enough for me to be able to say for sure what's, what's okay. going on. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, I think uh, maybe that would be a nice question to uh, finish uh, the discussion uh, on is uh, <laughs> quite an open one. Uh, <laughs> so in your opinion, what's the lowest size threshold for membrane protein? to be structured by cryo-EM. Thank you for this. Open. By our machine or by any machine? <laughs> by our spray, I think you'd still want to be, you know, certainly above 120, I'd have thought, because the ice is that bit thicker. But if you're using a real fancy down machine like the chameleon or something else, and I'm sure you can go lower for membrane protein. I mean, we have been looking at technologies where you can increase the bulk of like the smalp or things like that. So you can actually identify the membrane protein not yeah. by the protein itself, but by a surrogate on, on the scaffold. So that's one way of getting around that are antibodies. But yeah, again, it's so protein specific. It, if it's all transmembrane helices, it's a hard project. If it's one transmembrane helices and the rest is a big soluble region sticking out like a lollipop, you've, yeah. you've got a better chance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Yeah. Well, we covered a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you, everybody. So uh, let's start the next session. That is the last one of the day. That is about computational pipelines. The next speaker is uh, Misha uh, Kudryashev from the Max Planck Institute of Biophysics. He's a, a young uh, group leader there. 
and he will be talking about uh, subtomogram averaging. So whenever you want. Yeah, thank you. And thank you almost 190 people for staying with us. Uh, I'll talk to you about um, technology, which we first developed for essentially for ourselves, but uh, we feel that this is now a little bit more mature uh, and we will try to release it at some point. So we do tomography and we know, well know that tomography uh, has a big promise and uh, some very high resolution structures have been reported currently. Uh, however, it's just technologically diff difficult and it takes some time to learn it. It has many multiple um, uh, manual steps and um, the processing is very computationally demanding. And so as a result, there are some high resolution structures, but they actually, if we look at the high resolution structure depositions, then they come from a limited number of groups and uh, from a limited set of proteins. So uh, in my group, we study ion channels. And so this, is, this was uh, one of our applications. It's a reality receptor, ion, a large ion channel imaged in native membranes. And it's 2 and, and 2.2 megadalton, so it's rather large. You can, we can just really see the membranes. It looks like this. Um, and we got a 9.1 angstrom structure using this hybrid tomogram average, in with, which we recently reported. Uh, but this talk is not about it. Um, so the resolution that we get is essentially limited by the number of particles which we can image. So in that paper, we roughly had two and a half thousand particles, and uh, roughly we have 40 receptors per uh, tomogram. We would want to go for higher resolution, and for this, we would need to get significantly more data. Uh, we actually uh, managed to collect a slightly larger data set, uh, something like 300 tomograms. Uh, we had, we had uh, something like 60 before. Uh, but then it would again uh, include uh, manual processing and particle picking. Uh, so some more general consideration is that there is some progress in recording fast tomograms. So now what we can do is maybe 15 to 20 minutes to record one dose symmetric tomogram. And then the fast schemes uh, have a tomogram in a few minutes, but you still need to process them and uh, align uh, um, tomographic tilt series using typically gold beads or by cross correlation. And so I've done probably a few thousand reconstructions by, gold bead, by using gold beads in my life. And I, I really think that this could be done automatically. Um, and while there are several workloads that have been reported, so in, in my hands and in the hands of our people, uh, they do not achieve automatic performance. So we started building up our workflow really for ourselves from scratch. And this is a, a book chapter that we published uh, last year. Uh, it's really modular and we broke down the process into even more steps than a single particle. Uh, image processing. And it turns out that actually a lot of these steps are automated. Um, and so the green uh, means that the process is perfectly automatable. Uh, yellow means that it, it could be automated in some cases. And so the difficult parts were really tilt series alignment using gold beads. Um, but now I'll show you that it, it works in our hands and particle picking, which in some cases could be also done automatically. So the workflow, uh, that uh, we built uh, is made by Nikita Balashev. I'll show you uh, the results. And then uh, Ricardo Sanchez made a very uh, fast implementation of what could be uh, a better way to do subtomogram average, and which I'll show in the end. So essentially, uh, our workflow is just a set of uh, tools, uh, which are conventional, like motion core, GCTF, Dynamo, and IMOD. Uh, and uh, in interfaces between the data in and outflows. It's all implemented in MATLAB, but in principle, uh, Nikita now made sure that it could run with, uh, with compiled libraries. So in principle, you don't need to have um, a MATLAB license. So the, what the user needs to do is uh, set up a JSON style configuration file, uh, which has blocks. So it's all modular, a general metadata block, uh, what is your symmetry, how, where you want to store particle, uh, your, your data, and what would be the functional steps of your, of your workflow. Uh, so in our experience, we tried to do, uh, we tried several uh, um, uh, two-series alignment algorithms, algorithms, and then Dynamo uh, has a new feature of uh, two-series alignment using, using gold fiducials, which is implemented by Daniel Castano-Diaz, 
Uh, it's not published yet, but it's available. Dynamo is open source, and you can also uh, try it. So we, we have a very good experience by using this. And then, uh, so what you will see that uh, critical of operation is that if, uh, if the whole workflow will work automatically or not, would be basically if you can make uh, subtomogram averaging, uh, if you can, can pick, pick particles for subtomogram averaging using template matching. So uh, Nikita implemented all this in a workflow that basically uh, for the user is a one, one button uh, to start and run. And as we benchmarked this on a, on a classical benchmarking data set, it's 43 tomograms in super resolution mode recorded on K2 by John Briggs's group, uh, published originally in 2016 to the resolutions of 3.9, 3.4, and all the way to 3.0. Angstrom, it's a very nice data set. Um, and so this is the results of the processing. Uh, it's very colorful. Oh, I'm showing you the <laughs> I'm showing you the wrong screen. Uh, just give me a second. Okay, do you see my screen? Okay, uh, I, I think I hope you do. Right? Yeah. And so this is the uh, time that we took for, to process forty three tomograms on a single box. It has it had four graphical processors and forty cores of CPUs. And basically, we could get the reconstructions in, of 43 tomograms at low binning in roughly six hours, which means that you can actually uh, do uh, this uh, process in life in principle. So while you record data, you can already have the reconstructions and look and make sure that your reconstructions are uh, good looking. And then another 14 hours it took to do template matching. And then after a certain post-processing step, another 10 hours uh, we took for initial cleanup of the junk particles, which are false positives from uh, template matching and in order to get a seven angstrom structure. So the critical step here is template matching. Uh, this is how the cross-correlation map looks like. Actually, it's a, it, it's a template matching against a 20 angstrom structure of the uh, EMDB deposition. We can see very nice peaks. And so when we apply a certain threshold, we see that we can pick most of the particles. Some of the particles uh, form lattices that are not invariant, so that's normal. And some of the particles would be also false positives. After this, we uh, clean up the, the data set uh, with a few rounds of uh, simple uh, multi-reference classification. So in total from 43 tomograms, we ought to pick 280,000 particles. And this is, uh, a rather large data set. So this also works for uh, an other proteins in our lab. So here we could get good results with 15 angular degree step and this make, makes uh, the runtime very rather fast. And so for the range interceptor tomograms, you see these are the vesicles of native membranes and these are the range interceptors. We can see that we, could, we also get the peaks uh, on in our cross correlation maps. Uh, we also get uh, rubbish peaks from, let's say, gold beads or edges of the gold grids that we use. And we, need, we would need to clean up this later during the uh, multi-reference classification. Uh, but essentially, when you have a large enough particle or like a lattice, like a HIV gag, or your particles are isolated, you essentially can pick particles automatically. For some smaller proteins in our lab, this actually hasn't worked very well. Uh, and our workflow allows also to pick particles using the Dynamo catalog system uh, which uh, the workflow creates for the for the user. Uh, now, after we have picked the particles and we've done um, um, template matching, we're, we already know the, uh, the locations of the particles. Some of them are false positives. Uh, and here uh, is the way how we like to think that uh, subtomogram averaging can be done. We replace subtomogram averaging with a sub-stack analysis, which is uh, the work of Ricardo Sanchez in our group. So the way you do some tomogram averaging is that you have your tilt series, then you do a tomographic, perform a tomographic reconstruction, usually at low binning, then you crop particles. So your particles are 3D and then you align them uh, to a 3D reference. So what you do, you rotate reference on a set of angles and then you uh, perform uh, uh, cross correlations uh, calculation uh, in 3D. And then you, in the cross-correlation volume in Fourier space, you get your 
optimal shift and you also work out your optimal rotations. For this, you need to rotate 3D volumes many times, and this is really, really computationally intensive, uh, in particular when you have a very large size of your particle box. So what Ricardo's uh, has done is essentially he replaced the order of operations during the calculations of uh, 3D cross correlation. So what he does, he extracts a substack for each of the particle from the original tilt series. You know, since you've picked the particles in, in a tomogram, you know when, where each particle is in each projection. And so you can extract a substack which contains all the views of your particle in, the, uh, in your tomographic tilt series. And then instead of uh, rotating uh, basically 3D volumes, he projects the reference in, the, in a set of angles that would correspond to, to a set of rotation angles. Then he calculates a set of 2D cross correlations between, uh, yeah, between, the, between the respective uh, images. And then from those 2D cross correlations, he cr calculates the 3D cross correlation. Um, so it, this operation is equivalent. And uh, however, this project cross correlation has lower uh, complexity because you don't need to rotate 3D volumes. You just need to do the projections, but this can be done rather quickly. Uh, so this implementation also has certain uh, perks, like you can apply CTF uh, directly on the on the projections that you observe, so you can do CTF correction uh, slightly more uh, transparently, and you don't need to re-reconstruct the tomograms if you update the CTF, uh, the defocus values for your particles. Uh, obviously, you have different CTF for different for particles recorded at different height and at different angles. Uh, and Ricardo also implemented a CTF a TF refinement module, uh, which we use, which in our experience gives slightly better CTF correction, but this is uh, a little bit too specific for for this talk. Uh, so when you do this sub-stack refinement, you could, in principle, save your stacks on a hard drive. But in Ricardo's implementation, you actually don't need to do this. And you always load the tomogram in the memory uh, and extract the particles on the fly. And this also saves you a lot of uh, space on a hard drive. So you essentially only need to uh, do particle picking once on the very bean tomograms. And then when you do a tomogram, well, substack analysis, which is an equivalent to subtomogram averaging, then you only need to uh, read the memory in, in read the tomo tilt stack into memory. Um, and so as a result, the computational complexity reduces quite dramatically. So here we have roughly 600 angles scan scanning and Dynamo, which is a very fast subtomogram averaging engine on, implemented on GPU. And, uh, uh, spends a lot of time uh, to do some to do alignment of large boxes, while uh, Susan uh, performs these operations very very quickly. And this is in log scale, uh, so basically you can see the difference can it depends on the box size. It difference increases, and it can be order of magnitude or even two orders of magnitude. And the results are equivalent. So uh, Ricardo reprocessed the same data set, so he. Uh, skipped the angles which subtomogram, uh, which template machine gave him, and he started with very strong being and uh, for being in 16, he achieved 21 angstrom resolution, and then he reduced being well all the way to counting, where he had box sizes of 320, and he had independent half set refinement and ended up with three and a half angstrom structure. So it did take uh, two and a half days, but in my impression that uh, for 175 thousand particles times six, um, because Ricardo doesn't like using symmetry. So he did symmetry expansion instead of this number of particles, he had six times more. Uh, so in uh, if we really had to extract those particles, put it on a hard drive, read and align them to each other, this would have been a much longer uh, waiting time. In principle, uh, right now on 1080, uh, we can have box sizes up to th uh, 630, and in principle, with more memory on, on a graphical processing unit, uh, we could have a, even slightly larger boxes. So we're trying; we're still running this uh, alignment, and it's in pro in progress. So uh, in principle, you it's very unlikely that just time would allow you to uh, do to perform a processing in a super resolution mode if you do a classical subtomogram averaging and not the substacking analysis. 
Um, so that's very exciting. Uh, this brings me to my conclusions. So uh, the workflow that I showed you also is uh, space efficient. So since you don't need to have large tomograms and extract particles to the hard drive, then the original data set had 1.2 terabytes of data and the, the data processing folders resulted in another 1.2 terabytes, which is actually not a large multiplication of data. Uh, yeah, and this is because we don't need to generate all these large volumes. You can also have strong cleanup at, uh, at each point of the uh, post-processing and just leave even less uh, uh, particles on your hard drive in the end. Um, the workflow is modular, so let's say you can replace one module by, module by another. We have yet limited set of modules implemented, but let's say some people ask us if we can implement a fiducial less alignment where which is used for non for uh, for fib milling. So in principle, that's possible. We just need to find time to do that and test it. Uh, yeah. So up to subtomogram averaging or substack analysis. In our case, the workflow is mostly automated, and mm, yeah. So user can always in interfere by stopping and restarting the workflow, and he can. We also run a parallel. Uh, Itomo iMod, Itomo project, so that if the user is not happy with the gold bead alignment, he can actually refine them. Uh, however, this has not happened in our experience so far. So Susan is very fast, the substacking analysis. Uh, it's it very the way Ricardo implemented is very low level, so it's, it has a lot of flexibility and it will be integrated to the workflow that uh, a simple user could use it. Um, we plan to release the software. So, so far we're testing uh, alpha releases in-house, but potentially we would be happy to also have a beta release for everyone else. Uh, we have a planned feature to write the method section for everybody and it's supplementary table S1. Uh, and it's fast enough. So we could potentially have the functionality uh, of working live. So process your data while you record it. Uh, here, I'd like to thank the people who did the work. So uh, Nikita, Nikita, this person in with the beard, and Ricardo, uh, this person in black, did the work. So Ricardo developed Susan, Substack Analysis, and Nikita did the workflow. Uh, I want to thank my funding and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Susan is very fast. How fast would it work on a standard Tomo data set? Yeah, uh, thanks. So. So this, this is why we wanted to benchmark it, right? So on a HIV data set, which is standard, and this would, uh, the speed depends on the size of the box. So this is also the case for, uh, for any tomogram averaging pro process, but uh, for regular tomogram averaging grows as a power of three, for Susan it grows as a power of two. So with large boxes, you have an advantage. So this is a logarithmic scale, and this is a time for processing of 1,000 volumes uh, with 600 tested angles. So let's say a box of 240 would take five minutes. So uh, it's very fast. OK, good. And uh, you already partially answered it, but uh, I understand that it is not yet available. Uh, well, it, it's, a, it's still under development and it in principle works, but Ricardo still reworks some of the internal procedures and we need to write the manual, obviously. Mm -hmm. But there is another question. So for the motion correction part of the workflow, have you compared motion core two with IMOD's uh, aligned frames? No, no, this would be actually a great thing to do. Uh, however, in the classical workflow, we would need to do all the processing in parallel. So, and then when we have this modular workflow, we could replace the, mo the frame alignment and do the correction uh, and do the comparison. That would be very interesting to do. And there is another question. Have you benchmarked uh, against different biological specimens? And do you anticipate that some biological specimens will be harder than others? Yes, so my group works on ion channels. So these are membrane proteins. Uh, and the difference is that they are embedded in a membrane. A membrane is a large density that d often dominates the alignment. So we do test it on ion channels. And so in our experience, it works on some of them. Uh, so I guess that would be the most difficult proteins 
and we were testing it on it and it, it works it doesn't yet give higher resolution a, a somehow related question is uh, how successful would you say the particle picking in tomograms is so of all the coordinates selected what is the percentage of particle of coordinates that really represent a particle mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So this is why I had, uh, I tried to emphasize that uh, template matching is really the most important thing in making the workflow uh, automated or not. Uh, if the particle is large and isolated, like a ribosome in solution, it will be very successful in picking it. Uh, HAV, GAG, it's a lattice and it's, there is nothing else around. So template matching is very successful in picking it. Picking a small membrane protein in a membrane, uh, would probably be the opposite. It's unlikely to work. How small is a, is a small? So what is the 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 weight limit? What do you say? Uh, so two hundred. So in thin enough ice, we could we could get good cross correlation peaks for a two hundred fifty kilodalton protein, which is roughly maybe 15, 12 to fifteen uh, nanometers in the longest dimension. Yeah, and also for membrane proteins. Uh, the membrane tends to dominate the alignment, and if so, how to overcome that? Yes, uh, excellent question. So when you do template matching, you actually, and if it works, and it, if it gives you defined peaks like, like here, then you know that your particle is rather well centered. And uh, this means that you can limit the shifts that you allow your particles to basically to move in different directions. And the way to uh, another way to exclude the influence of the membrane would be to apply a mask on the reference uh, to focus your alignment on the actual proteins. And then you need to uh, then it's then it gets a bit tricky because you need to tweak uh, well try several masks. Uh, if it would be too tight, it can also pr produce artifacts. If it will be too wide, then it, the membrane will dominate the alignment. So you would have to find something in between. Uh, and in Susan, can you somehow restrain the limits of the search, the angular search and the shift? Yeah, Susan is essentially, is this uh, operationally, it's the, the same uh, thing as subtomogram averaging. So you can scan limited number of angles, you can limit the maximum shifts, and you can apply masks on references. I see. And, and for the particle picking, does it work searching with a blob rather than a template? Yes, yeah, so searching with a blob would give you most largest density that has the size of a blob. Mm -hmm. So if you have purified proteins like purified ribosomes, then it would work very well. Otherwise, it will not be very specific. And, and I understand you have presented two pieces of software. One was Susan, the other one was the automated pipeline. So the automated pipeline is something that is also available or not? Or? Uh, it's still a bit buggy uh, and we have an in-house release where some people have successfully used it. So basically both pieces of software are, are in a similar state where they are functional by the developers and partially functional by people in our group. So we will package them and test it maybe on several give it to some other users and then we can have a proper release probably also as a docker because the workflow uses several other packages in my experience the tilt series alignment is also one of the bottlenecks uh, if it is automated so again what, what is the success rate in your opinion uh, so we use dynamo uh, tilt series which is which we find very robust uh, and in our hands it's almost never fails. Okay. Uh, also, I mean, it, it gives a lot of other perks, like if if the, so it finds stable uh, tilt lines of the gold beads, and if the gold bead, the stable tilt lines do not extend to a given, uh, to a given projection, then Dynamo will also report that this projection is likely to be a tracking error. So this is useful to exclude uh, rubbish data in the end. So that there is another question on the surface of SR vesicles. I don't know what SR is. Oh, it's, this is this uh, these vesicles that. Okay. Are there are also a lot of 
CERC uh, TPA is there. So how, how Susan can distinguish between the protein you're interested and in other particles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Well, Randy receptor is very large. Uh, maybe I can even show you like a slightly more filtered image, right? So it's just huge and it bends the membrane at the same time. So the membrane is a little bit bent. While Cerca is small, it comes with groups and it does not bend the membrane. So multi-reference alignment uh, works just very well. Very well. Great. Um, so thank you very much, Misha and Sean, and to all the rest of our speakers today. Um, it's been a really, really good program of talks and um, yeah, really, really enjoyed all of them.